Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hello, my name is Terry, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Terry. And I welcome everybody here. I was one of the last ones here, but... Uh, I guess everybody comes from the coast, uh, but everybody came from Bend, you got, you met a semi across the road for three hours anyway. Uh, you don't want to know about all that stuff. Uh, this, um, a lot of you are veterans of retreats, and some of you aren't, I guess. I just want to say a, a word about a retreat. I think it's a time it's not a workshop or a lecture series. Uh, it's a time to get in touch with God's gift. See, we're already being drawn into a deep spiritual awakening, and there's a lot of experience and deep spiritual change in everybody in this room right now. And if we had the right kind of facilitator, we could write the big book. Could. I mean, the ammunition's here. Uh, the, if we could discern our own experience well enough, if we could put our finger on the authentic and the, what's really touched our heart in a healthy way and be able to tell the difference between that and what isn't so genuine and deep. And, uh, but it's all here. All the good deep stuff is here. Uh, and what happens as we go along is that God's gift tends to get obscured by the onrush of life. It especially get and there's a funny thing that happens where it gets obscured um, just by getting better. You know? It's a paradoxical thing. That nobody starts getting better until they get worse. <laughs> nobody gets interested in the spiritual life until we're sure nothing else works. <laughs> and uh, uh and the the, the process of making sure nothing else works usually just about kills a person <laughs> and finding out. So we're suffering very deep frustration and helplessness and kind of a demoralization that for most alcoholics and Al-Anon members, it amounts to being so beat up by struggling and trying to make it work in the way we think we should. Trying to drink right. Not get into trouble, uh, <clears throat> and trying to not drink at all and be cheerful and well balanced, <laughs> or, doing, or trying to um, uh, run a family and and uh, not control everybody, but just get enough cooperation for their own good <laughs> that'll <laughs> save them. Uh, and when the measure of frustration gets intense enough, we give up the whole project of trying. We just lose interest in it, you know? We get bored with it. Just <clears throat> run out. And that's the, the moment of openness to God's grace. That's the, somehow, the hitting bottom is, and I'm, that's what I want to really meditate on here. This, this time is the hitting bottom and uh, powerlessness. But just this introductory thing about what's a retreat about, that as we get in through powerlessness to begin our recovery, we uh, indeed get touched with the program. We start getting the message. We start letting our higher power be kind to us through other people. And we start making peace with the truth about ourselves. Oh, Oh, I don't have to get over it. I don't have to get over being a dingbat alky who's an egomaniac with a dirty mind. <laughs> I don't get over that at all? No, you don't get over it. You stay that way. But you... you God has lots of experience working with that type. And you'll, you'll be all right. You just, you get used to being who and what you are. 
and then a day at a time don't drink. <laughs> and uh, uh, what is this anyway? This is anyway. Uh, and then by simply not drinking and by letting go and letting people be kind of doing the the basic. Um, turning over that we do, we get a reward right away. The minute we put the program into action, it works for anybody who does it. And it works precisely to the extent that we do footwork. And we get the payoff starting now. It isn't like way down the road when you graduate. It's the first day uh, that we're willing to be open and not have it. It's just wonderful. Um, and the more we get um, recovery, the better we feel. The better we feel, and the more we do other footwork, the healthier we are, and the and the better we we live. We we live in a way that's self-respect begins to turn return, and we start to be effective in what we want to do. And as we start to be effective in what we want to do, a couple of things happen. One is is that we're not hurting as much, and so we don't have the same motivation to be interested in the spiritual life as we had when we started. <laughs> and besides not being in the same amount of pain, we also can't help but wonder how well we're doing. <laughs> you, know, you, just, you can't help but be interested. You know, just how well is my recovery going on? Well, how can you tell? By comparing yourself to somebody else's. How well are you doing at your work? Compare yourself to the other person. Do they get a better report? And as soon as we're not in pain and paying attention to how well we're doing, God's gift becomes obscured and we need a retreat. As soon as we're doing that, we get filled with other stuff and the shine goes off the apple. You know, It's just, it happens to everybody. Happens to me, happens to... That's the way the Catholics got these retreat houses going to begin. This is way before AA, <laughs> or al uh, And it was uh, mostly for the people, the professionals, you know, uh, that the people who are supposed to be working at this on a steady basis need retreats more than anybody else. Uh, because they, they just do. They do. So, th that's that. Um I'd like to just reflect with you on the basically the first step. You know, admitted we were powerless over alcohol and our lives had become unmanageable. The um, I, I think if we... It's my favorite step. It's the most characteristic step of the program. The surrender step is the heart of recovery. And everything else we do is kind of putting surrender into action. And it's kind of the heart of the spiritual life. But the first step is the signature of our program. That's the... That's what makes AA and Al-Anon what it is. Uh, and then the rest of it is standard spirituality. What, um, uh, and the first step, you know, is this, you come right, right off the bat, they come at you with something that just turns everything upside down as our recovery begins. Uh, we come to the program and we hear rumors that Al-Anon will help you. Uh, I say Al-Anon because I already met some people in Al-Anon. I'm assuming this is kind of a group of recovering people of alcoholics, dope fiends, Al-Anons. Uh, yeah, yeah, mixed, mixed religion. Um, and, um, and as soon as we start out, they, they tell you uh, that, um, that they're not going to help you. They're not going to help you in the way you want to be helped. What we want to, I want to learn how to drink right or learn how not to drink and be hip and cheerful and have, and be in such good shape that my alcoholism is invisible. I want to, I, I don't mind being an alcoholic as long as I don't feel it and you don't see it. Um, <laughs> And, and AA says, no, we're not going to help you do that. We'd like you to 
Oh, we're going to rub your nose in it. No. <laughs> we're going to hold your hand while you get used to being alcoholic, and you're going to be more alcoholic than you ever dreamed when you're done with this. It's the funny way to introduce it. But that's the, the first step. Um, to get to the point. The point's made in, um, in the serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, the wisdom to know the difference. Now, that prayer is answered, starts to be answered in the very beginning of our recovery when the, the distinction starts to be made between the things we cannot change and the things we can change. Um, and when, in our illness, I don't think any of us ever spend two minutes wondering. Did you ever? I never wondered. Gee, I wonder what the things are that I can't change and what the things... I mean, I never, I never asked that. You know? I just had this vague thing that there was a go big gob of pain and frustration in my life and I wanted to get rid of it. I wanted to dissolve it or take care of it. I wanted it to go away. Uh, that's all. And and so they stop you at the door and say, we'd like to make a distinction. What do you mean distinction? I want to get rid of this thing. I want to get over it. Help me. Well, we're making a distinction. See, all running through the big gob is your disease of alcoholism, your disease of codependency, your disease, as they call it, of belief and control. <laughs> your deeply rooted belief that if you could just control a little better, it would help everyone a lot. <laughs> you know? uh, and that's a form of insanity that every human being gets, almost. And running through this big gob is, is our disease, our alcoholism and our belief and control. And then all of the behavior and feelings and actions that come from, from that disease. And want to say, guess what? You don't have to do the things that the disease pushes you to do. But the only way you can possibly, with God's help, do the footwork and not have a drink a day at a time, is with God's help, get on better terms with your disease. Make friends with it. Get acquainted with it. Go out with it. Uh, introduce it to your friends. Um, listen to your, to your friends about their disease. Introduce your disease to their disease. Uh, have them play together, you know. Uh, really bring it to the family, you know, this, and get used to it instead of, and then change. We really change. But we change footwork. And we don't change anybody. We don't change people, places, and things. We don't play into our disease. And that's, huh? You know? And we usually don't get that kind of a lecture about it. People simply start treating us. They just lead us along and have us do things that indicate that the important thing is to change our footwork and to accept ourselves fully without any reservations as who we are. Um, that falls in deaf ears until we've been through what they call hitting bottom. Um, because we can't hear that. Um, now, uh, I'm not going to tell my story now, but but just kind of follow. I want to do follow my own experience a bit, just to il illustrate my understanding of what kind of resistance everybody puts up. Uh, I think it's important for us to to see that our resistance to the first step is rooted not in some kind of a childish, like the worst part of us. No, I won't cooperate. No. Uh, it's rooted in our highest ideals. It's rooted in the thing in us that wants to be loyal to family and not disappoint our mothers and be good. We, you know, our parents and everybody knew we weren't going to be perfect, but they didn't think you were going to be an alcoholic. <laughs> you know? They didn't think you were going to be so off that once someone else had alcoholism in your family, you got right in there, cooperated with it, and helped it be worse uh, <laughs> in your efforts to help it out. That you did everything backwards and wrong. That you, They didn't raise you to be that dumb. Uh, 
And so we, there's something in us that, that doesn't want to be that, not just because we don't want to be embarrassed, but because we have to maintain something. We have to maintain some sense of ourselves as worthwhile. Uh, my definition of worthwhile is um, somebody who has a little sense. I kind of came on that recently. Because my own story about being an alcoholic is that I'm, the word alcoholism gained respectability in my family when I was very young. My father got into AA in 1943. 44. He had a couple of slips. He died in withdrawal when I was six and a half years old. I had three little sisters and an older brother. Uh, but not be, he died not before he brought home easy does it one day at a time. It's a disease. The first drink gets you drunk. Once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. And so we had all of this stuff. And the, don't think you're, don't think badly of your father and your uncles. They have a disease. Pray for them. So I prayed for them. My mother had three brothers who were alcoholics too. Uh, so I grew up with my uncle Bill and my uncle Matt. A few married into the family too. Uncle Ed. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so I, uh, I was aware of alcoholism, and my mother even used to point out, you see, see that man, Mr. Moorfield, he is an alcoholic, and he's been sober for five years, and isn't that wonderful? We, that's just, he would, she, I remember her pointing out this guy in admiration that this is just great. It's an alcoholic who's sober. And so I had this attitude that uh, alcoholism isn't wrong or bad, it's a disease. And the important thing is to accept God's help. That's pretty advanced for the 40s. You know? And uh, so I grew up with that stuff. I went to meetings with my Uncle Bill when I got in the program when I was 12 or 13. I wrote a paper on alcoholism after I got in college in the seminary. Uh, went to meetings for research again. I read the big book two years before I had a drink and several other books. And it was almost my hobby before I drank. And, uh, <laughs> And when I, when I started drinking, um, you know, you can talk about crossing the invisible line. I crossed the invisible line sometime in the early afternoon of my 21st birthday, <laughs> the day I began to drink. And uh, I was obsessed in the way we are familiar with. You know? Just not, I just thought it was absolutely wonderful. The most wonderful. God, I... I gained a deeper respect for my father and my uncles on the spot. Uh, I, um, I just loved it. I could hardly wait to the next time I got some. And I thought of alcoholism the first day, and I thought, boy, whatever you do, don't become an alcoholic, because that means you can't drink. Be careful. Uh, uh, and, uh, and so the never occurred to me that I ever could possibly be demented like my Uncle Bill and my father. You know, the, and as I went along, it just picked up. You know, the disease progressed. Uh, didn't get to drink much in those early years. But as, it, as I was ordained a priest and started going down the tubes, I thought, you know, you're showing si symptoms of the disease. I guess you better stop. My mom always said if they'd only admit it, then they can do something about it. And I was beginning to think, well, it looks like you're a pre-alcoholic anyway. If you are, that means you're not going to learn how to drink right. Save yourself some trouble and just stop. And I, well, I wonder when I'm going to stop. And I kind of messed with that. And not to tell the whole thing, but I, I stopped for six months one time and started again because I figured anybody who could stop for six months had proved he could stop. Yeah. And as long as you know you can stop, you might as well start because... <laughs> If you have any trouble, you just stop again. You know? And um, and I um, and then I got into started getting into trouble and making resolutions and doing my chapter three and four. And um, and the point I want to make about the the first step is that as it sunk into me, yeah, you're really an alcoholic. You just got to stop. I always thought that if I ever if this gets serious. <laughs> I mean, it's hard, and there's obsession and everything. But if it gets, when the chips are down, if it gets serious, I'll stop. Because 
even that powerless, all that's kind of rhetoric for people who don't understand. Because I'm somebody, I'm, I was willing to say I was alcoholic, you see. Understanding that in a very shallow way. Clinging to my identity of being somebody who had a little sense. And that when, it, when push came to shove, when it really got tough, well, I'll come through. I'll come through. I'm the kind of guy who comes through. I have a little sense. I'm not totally nuts. A little crazy, ha, ha, ha. But, I mean, when it gets serious, I'll do it. And, um, and when it got serious, I'd quit, all right, and then I'd start. And I got in trouble and was fired. And then I went to a hospital and had aversion treatments. And that, my gosh, they got me. I guess it's only fair and square. I thought I could stop. You know, I didn't, the aversion needed this. I went through aversion treatments and got all set and lasted four months and was drinking again. I was in terrible trouble, went back and took the whole aversion treatment thing over again. And then it was, and then something began that, that cold chill inside. That something is awfully wrong. You know? Something's out of hand. And I don't know quite what it is or what to do. I was saying my prayers. I was even admitting I was alcoholic. And saying my prayers and getting drunk. I didn't think it made any sense to go to AA because if I went there, all they'd do is tell me what I already knew. They'd tell me I'm alcoholic. I know that. The first one gets you drunk. I can tell them stories about that. I know that. And they'll tell me that I should trust God. And I just as soon not have some ex-Mormon trying to explain that. To me. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, I'll do that on my own. And I wouldn't... Um, I clung to my identity. I, I think it's the point here is identity. When we take the first step, our identity is crushed. It's overcome. Nobody can let go of their identity while with your eyes open and being calm. You don't turn in who you are and say, okay, I'll give up trying to maintain this identity. Doesn't seem to be working very well. Um, <laughs> I'll take a new one. I'd like to reconstruct one and, uh, uh, along the more realistic lines and uh, any suggestions. Uh, we don't treat this sensibly. It's a, it's a spiritual thing. Because we don't even... I don't think we know what our identity is until it's crushed. We don't know the sticking point, what we're clinging to hardest. My, my self-understanding is somebody... For me, it was a, someone with a little sense. And when it comes to alcohol, I don't have a little sense. I'm insane. I have a disease where I act insanely in regard to alcohol unless I have massive support of a very special kind that I don't make up. That's a support that comes through the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and a help from a power greater than myself through other people and the steps and the fellowship and that supporting me seems to open me up to receive the gifts of sobriety where I can live like a human being while I stay an alcoholic. Uh, but that's not what I understood myself. I, no, no, I just couldn't get that. I, I didn't, it didn't ever occur to me, I was, I would never be that bad off. I thought, yeah, I need God's help, of course. I need God's help, you know, the way you need a little extra push or something. That's not the way we need God's help. We need God's help if someone just to pick the mess off the floor. Up, you know, I need God's help in a big way. I need God's help to give me the wisdom that I just don't have at all. It's not that I need a few more hints. I can't. I need one more piece of the puzzle. I don't need one more piece of the puzzle. I need to drop the whole project and humbly accept the invitation to walk in a radically different way, accepting myself as a powerless person of alcohol who needs massive support in a fellowship, uh, through all that stuff, I, it's different, you know. Uh, and I can't agree to that because I don't even have a place to stand to look at it, you know. I'm, uh, there's no place, no perspective. And the only way is, is a tumbling through, losing your identity. Um, it seems to be the way it works. It's not an intellectual process, it's a spiritual process. The spiritual process of 
um, somehow, and maybe it's the most mysterious thing in the world. You know. Do you know why some people sober up and some people don't? I don't know. We can describe a little bit about what we do, what we don't do. Well, I don't really we understand it. But there's some moment where something inside lets go and I'm willing to be an utter failure at trying to be what I thought I should be. I'm willing to be a, a this is settled. I can't do that. I, I didn't make it. Now, pretty fundamental. When I admit failure on the deepest thing I was trying to do, that makes me disappear. That makes me, as my old understanding of myself, collapses. I don't get to say anymore, I'm someone with a little sense. I'm nuts relative to alcohol. Anyway, that it, I experienced that. And I, with, um, uh, there are two, a couple of first step experiences I'd like to share. One was in the host, my sixth detox under lock and key. Uh, and it was in the, while I was there, it occurred to me that I was going to be drunk again pretty soon. It occurred to me, you're the type that gets drunk again, no matter what you do. It doesn't matter what prayer you pray, what counselor you talk to, what resolution you make, what book you read. It doesn't matter. You're flawed. It doesn't Things don't work with you. You just get drunk again. Because you just lose interest in recovery, a little bored with it, and just have a drink. You're the heartbreaker. You're the one there's nothing to talk about with you. Because we've talked enough. You've got enough motivation to do it. But you don't. That's you. <laughs> uh, and that's, that's a first... I consider that a gift from God and permitting me to experience my powerlessness over alcohol. It didn't feel good at the time. It, uh, but it has a little good feeling to it. The little good feeling was, oh, I don't have to do that. I'm a failure. I'll kind of adjust to that, you know. Um, and then the next, I went back east and I was at a recovery house in New Jersey going to meetings and getting to like it and not knowing why I liked it. I was identifying with people. You know? I was, I was home. Of course I liked it. Uh, and as I was going along, I remember hearing a guy uh, give a pitch, and he says, and the thing about me is I can only stay sober one day at a time. No, I'd been listening to the guy. He already had me, see? I was identifying with him. And when he said one day at a time, I considered that the most empty, meaningless slogan that AA had. The kind of thing you say to brain damaged people when you can't think of anything else to say. <clears throat> you know, one day at a time, like two days at a time, three days. Didn't mean anything, you know. Kind of an empty slogan to me. Irritating, besides. Um, and when this guy said one day at a time, because I was identifying with him, I believed him. I didn't even know. I just believed him. And the minute I believed him, I, my feeling was, oh, the poor guy. I didn't think he was that bad. He seemed kind of smart. Um, <laughs> well, I guess he was. You know, show up each morning. I can't remember enough. You know, can't remember what I learned before. Got to start one day all over again today. <laughs> you know. I wanted to get it together, you know. And he's talking about showing up with your empty bowl humbly before God. A little sobriety, please. <laughs> I don't have any. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I thought, and then it's a few beats later I realized it applied to me. And as I realized it applied to me, I felt humiliated. I felt like a five-year-old. Here's little Terry. He's sober all day today. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? Very nice. Very good. Now you run along now. We'll call you later. <laughs> and the, in a few beats after that, that humiliation began to change. 
into a very deep relief. I was humiliated relative to my old identity, relative to my ego. It didn't match my understanding of my macho, intellectual, I'll take care of it. Uh, I have a little sense. It doesn't. And it's, so it destroyed that. Uh, and, but the, the relief, you know, identifying with somebody, see, hitting bottom to be constructive is just about dying from frustration and identifying with somebody else with the same frustration who's living. So that we can stand identifying with the, the depth of our own powerlessness, but with that identification, there's a spark of hope where we can stand it. No. Where the, the message is, you can be that bad and live. You can be that bad and live very well. Do just fine. So it was, uh, I was uh, like, like I walked to a tunnel, and at the other end of the tunnel was this, whew, I could drop this terrible burden. I felt like I was, um, uh, somebody who, was carrying around, to be sober on the wagon, to be dry on the wagon, is like carrying about seven army blankets. I don't know, I think of army blankets, the hard wool. And if you carry seven of them, you could do it. But if you're carrying them, you know, this is going to get old. (laughs) I can do this, but I have a feeling I'm going to lose interest in this. (laughs) And, uh, that's being dry to me. That's sobriety without the program. And the, it just said to me, a day at a time meant I could drop all the blankets on the floor. I don't, I, I don't have to stay sober for the rest, the rest of my life every minute. You know? I was always staying sober for the rest of my life every minute. Every minute, I had the whole rest of my life in there. <laughs> being, you know, the fun is over. Uh, too bad I'll never be able to relax again <laughs> for the rest of my natural life. Uh, that kind of thing. And the, so that's the relief, um, of just acknowledging that we're alcoholic. It's, but it's, there's a lot in there. It's kind of a simple experience very often when we simply identify and become part of the fellowship and kind of be one with other people and have that attitude. But the, uh, one of the things we do when we, when we agree to be alcoholic is that we agree not to even try to get over it. We agree not to think, we kind of get in on the attitude that, oh, this isn't the thing you feel bad about, okay? This is the thing you just get matter of fact about. We're not working on this anymore. We're not working on getting, improving our alcoholism. Like getting it to be not real bad alcoholism, getting it to be Civilized, not so bad alcoholism. We're not working on that. Where could you have died from drinking? Uh, if the answer is yes, that's as bad as, any, as bad as anybody can get. And um, so we we become the shame just drains away. It drains away. We become more matter of fact, more relaxed, and that <laughs> wonderful spirit of very deep self acceptance. And it spreads. It's not just self-acceptance of our own alcoholism. It's the acceptance of other people's alcoholism um, that's very positive. You notice how there's a, there's a deep wisdom in the fellowship. When somebody comes in and, um, and they're kind of new and they talk about a drunk dream or an obsession to drink of their car, almost went into, a, into the, just went and parked its regular place at the liquor store. And they didn't even know how it did it, you know. And they're halfway out of the car. And they say, I'm, I was going into the liquor store the way I usually do. And I realized I was going to get a, get a bottle and I caught myself and I felt confused and kind of ashamed and, you know what? How can this happen? And what's the reaction? Your reaction to that? The reaction is, isn't it wonderful you didn't have to have a drink? Great. You had an obsession. Yeah, yeah, that's because you're alcoholic. And there's an affirmation of the person and their disease and a rejoicing that they didn't have to suffer from actually drinking. Do you ever think of saying, you did what? (laughs) You did... You... 
you, you've heard all these pitches and you still want to drink? Yeah. You don't have any... I mean, can't you catch on to anything? Uh, uh, you know, does the deep wisdom, the fact that I just said that, shocked you, didn't it? And yet, that talk that we never hear in the program is logical talk if you had, didn't take the first step. If you didn't have the spiritual experience of the first step. It takes a deep wisdom with it that's supportive of other people all the time. And that deep wisdom and that inner peace and that, that foundation of beginning to work a program where we get to know something about having the serenity to accept things we cannot change and that we shouldn't have to change. Nobody can change. Don't worry about it. It's not like, oh, gee, we can't change it. Uh, no. What we can't change, we shouldn't change. Shouldn't try to. It's just fine. Um, that is a funny thing about it. Is that uh, as we find an equilibrium and a peacefulness and kind of a matter of fact, yeah, the alcoholic, yeah. yeah let me tell you about it. Um, there's this wonderful fresh air around it. The relaxation. And when you have it, it seems as if when that shame drains away from being alcoholic and it just like out from going to meetings and just not having a drink a day at a time and you, and you do get pretty just relaxed about it. It just seems so natural. Like why, why was I ever worried about this? Why was this too bad when a person has to be ashamed of their condition? Um, and it just seems to be so true and natural that it's hard to imagine losing it. And we lose it as soon as we stop nourishing it. It's a dynamic thing. We lose it, the, we don't lose it all at once, but we, it erodes and shame and confusion return. The minute we block off the normal support and nourishment we need for the first step. The normal support and nourishment we need is constant live identification with other folks in the same situation. And when someone stops going to meetings and stops kind of walking that path, isn't it funny how they just like you not to bring it up? You know? You're an alcoholic? Well, yes. What's it to you? Yeah. It, as soon as there's a little regret, you know, a little regret seeps in, we're on our way back to shame. There's a, uh, I have to say that the commandments of the world are in force at all times. They're in the air, they're in our bones, and it works against the first step. These commandments of the world, I made them up, so don't take them too seriously. But they... <laughs> It occurred to me when someone was complaining one time about the commandments in Scripture that there are commandments that have nothing to do with God or Scripture that are harder on us than any other commandments. And I've, I've internalized these, and I'll just give you the ones I think are in force, and you see if you identify with this. These are the commandments I think that we learn early. We internalize them. We never have to have them repeated again because we, we got them. And we try to obey them automatically at all times. Number one, there's five of them. Number one, thou shalt not have anything wrong with you. <laughs> Number two, if you have something wrong with you, get over it fast. <laughs> Number three, if you can't get over it, at least pretend that you got over it. <laughs> Number four, if you can't even pretend you got over it, we'd like you to stay away from here. <laughs> Number five, if you insist on hanging around her anyway, we'd like you to have the decency of being ashamed of yourself. <laughs> did, you, did you get it inside of you enough? That's a living thing. The living force of shame that's in our society, we've learned. And unless I have direct, contrary, affirmation, the spirit of living, loving, acceptance, and identification, that kind of stuff just eats in there. 
12 step says we practice these principles in all our affairs. And one of the principles it talks about is the first step. And that we not just talk about powerlessness over alcohol, but our lives have become unmanageable and apply the first step to all other areas of our life. And I'd like to just say a few things, start a little late, um, about the principle uh, powerlessness in the lives of most of us, other than alcohol, and that it is really the center of uh, those who work the al program, the center of the disease. In other words, what is it in relationships that's equivalent to alcoholism in re relative to, alcohol, to drinking, you know, to living a life with alcohol? Now, what is it in the al program that you accept as what you cannot change about yourself? And what is it that you change? We change our own footwork, our behavior. What is it that we do? Well, we say we don't change them, right? We don't change people, places, and things. We give our own witness, right? What about inside of ourselves? What is it that we don't change there? The way an alcoholic doesn't change the twofold illness of the allergy of the body coupled with an obsession of the mind. Don't mess with that. That's there. What you do is get a program so you get enough help to live with that. And it is something I already mentioned. I, well, there's different ways. My opinion is that a good description of it is belief in control. That there's something down deep that's eradicable that you can't root out. It's not something that you work the program to get rid of. It's something on account of which you work the program. If you're an Al-Anon for a while and you notice that you main, that you, you've noticed inside yourself that you have a recurring urge <laughs> to, to control and that you have recurring fantasies, fantasies of bringing about reform uh, in yourself and others, fantasies that, you know, God, if it only listen. It only pick up that pamphlet. It only read page. If they'd only hear this tape, you got to listen to this tape. Yeah. Uh, if they'd only, and if you have that, if you're ready to sell this sort of thing, I don't consider that the least bit alarming. You know? I consider that signs that you qualify for the program. And if we take those things as a sign that we haven't worked the program hard enough, we can get into real deep trouble because we'll be fighting ourselves. We'll be trying to get ourselves weller than well. We'll be trying to get our... It's the equivalent of an alcoholic trying to get over alcoholism to get... It'll be an awkward kind of tape because it'll turn over a few more minutes. Um, it'll be... Um, so the equivalent of an alcoholic accepting the feeling of an obsession. You have uh, you catch yourself in the middle of, let's say, just a sort of a depression in the day. You're just having a lousy day. You feel lousy, and uh, and nothing hurts really. You're just and you you kind of well, what's going on? You know, you start to talk to somebody, and you realize that the reason you're you're just sad and angry and hurting that someone you love isn't doing it right. You just, damn. You just, it, for their own good. They know better now. They, you know, they know. They've been to meeting. Their sponsor talked to them. And we'll find ourselves just being sad that they're not doing better. Now, the root of it is the belief that if they would change, if I had control over them to change just a little bit, to fine-tune them, then we could be happy and it'd be all right. But I don't, and I believe the control would be good, and I don't have it, and that is very sad. 
Um, <laughs> no, when a person, so what, I think if a person caught himself there, herself, at that point of awareness, and if we didn't work the first step, we'd turn on ourselves and beat ourselves up. You stupid. Just, just can you listen? You should have learned that in the first few weeks of al You know, you don't you know, ball yourself out. And besides being depressed, be angry and self-contemptuous. Um, uh, you know, really feel worse uh, as a way of purging or something. And, um, uh, and if we work the first step and we catch ourselves at that point, we could say, ah, okay, it figures that I'd be depressed about that because I have a belief because I'm the type that is convinced that it'd be better for them to behave the way I think they should. And, um, and what I need is not to turn myself inside out. And what I need to do is some pretty basic workouts in the program. A little basic workout of, uh, talking to a sponsor and asking God to give me help to release with love and to accept myself as somebody who has a belief in control. But with the help of the program, it's going to act more sanely right now so I can you know, live my life and live my life and accept God's gift of this life and, and do some stuff and work with others where I'll get a little more perspective on this so that as I go along with my belief in control, it will control my life and behavior less and I can have a life. And uh, The alcoholic remains alcoholic. And the Al-Anon remains somebody who has a belief in control, who with the help of the program can live a life sanely uh, and can be kind and tolerant of the disturbing feelings that come up when we get recurring attacks of fantasy and, and or discover depression in the middle of that. Um, but put, the, put it into action. But to catch ourselves so any alcoholic who catches himself in an obsession, the minute we, as we experience the obsession, as we experience the thing coming on, and don't associate it with obsession, yeah, just just feel the raw. I want to think I'm going to have a drink. A drink would help a lot, you know. You just we get into the thing, and the first way we experience it always is of shame. We feel disturbed. We feel yearning, and we feel mixed up. And we feel kind of ashamed that we do. And it's confusing. It's always, any obsession is confusing. And that we need the whole program to enter in kindly, you know? Enter in without violence. And, and with respect for ourselves. Say, don't, don't jump all over yourself. And, well, you don't want to drink. No, that's why you need the program. You qualify the program. You deserve a hug at the next meeting. Feeling like that. And on and on. We apply this in all our affairs. In all of our... Uh, you know, is anybody in here a liar? Uh, it's about telling the truth. Now, you know, there's two approaches to growing in the truth. One approach is to get over being a liar. That's the non-program way. Get over it. Do you have the same feeling I have when someone says, one thing about me is I call them as I see them. I tell the truth. No more lying for me. You get the truth out of me. I want to I wanna get out of range, you know. Because uh, if, they, if they think they're telling the truth all the time, I... It's dangerous. You know? uh, I was so taken with somebody who started a pitch and he said, I'm going to try to tell the truth but I'm a professional con man and I'm so good at lying I don't know half the time when I'm doing it myself. So so be careful. I, I listened to everything he said. This is fascinating. You know? I want to hear somebody who is able to acknowledge they're a liar and they need God's help to tell the truth one day at a time. And they've got all the inclinations and the the faults and the 
whatever, to tell a lie. But with God's help, I'm going to tell the truth enough to live. And uh, Does anyone have any trouble with their sex life? <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> and, uh, You know, the non-program way of handling sex problems is to get over them all. <laughs> get over it, you know. And it, depend, <laughs> depending on what it is, you know, if... Um, <laughs> let's, let, let's pick something biblical. Uh, <laughs> let's pick... Um, you know, it's a classic adultery. Uh, okay. If it's, if it's if adultery has been in your life and you didn't feel terrific about it, uh, you might say, "Well, I want to get over that." Nope. Over. No more of that. We're finished. You know. That's the non-program way. Program way is to say, "I'm an adulterer." forever, who doesn't commit adultery today, and uh, with any kind of luck won't find it necessary to go through the, the double speak and the confusion and the uh, all that stuff, all that emotional draining and lots of hard work and uh, that's required. <laughs> um, and, uh, and that I'll maintain the status, however, of being an adulterer because I don't want to let my own fear and ego uh, be pandered to to try to get me ooh, away from that. I get away from things. You want to get away from And the first step says, we're not above anything. We don't get away from anything. We don't get over anything. We are invited by a higher power to accept everything, accept ourselves as powerless over alcohol, powerless over relationships and that one day at a time with God's help in the program we can act more sanely and have a life and the more we identify with one another the more deeply peaceful we become that's who we are and we got to figure that part of our problem is when we're hurting and when the ego is out there that we'll always have an urge to do some real dumb thing to make ourselves feel better. <laughs> we'll have an urge to abolish, you know, get over something completely, instead of simply humbly doing our footwork. And when we humbly do footwork and stay in the fellowship, we do very well. You know? And we, uh, and there's the first, the first step call. Well, with that, I started late, but it's almost a whole hour. So let's, uh, let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. And I'll, um, I guess I should say, I'll get a little uh, paper in the morning. I'll have a paper to sign for, um, little, right before the first talk. If you want to talk one on one and have the time to talk to a few people, just be up here and sign the paper. Uh, but now let's pray the Lord's Prayer, then have a break of about 10 minutes or so and have a little sharing meeting for an hour. Stand. This is the end of session one, the start of session two. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Let's pray the serenity prayer. God, God give me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Yeah. Okay, I mentioned, uh, don't put the tape yet, okay? <laughs> Okay. I'd like to share a bit this uh, with you this morning on the issue of faith in a higher power, second step. I came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Um, and there's a, I think we're all in the same starting line with this. You know, the priests and the atheists have the same challenge and the same discovery, the same gift from God and being given a faith that works. And the 
fourth chapter of the big book to the agnostic, it says the whole purpose of this book is to enable you to find a higher power that will solve your problem. It's a very practical approach. This is real America, real pragmatic. Uh, it isn't too theoretical. It's like, let's, let's find something that works in this area of faith. Uh, and of course, what, what works is usually something very different than what we have been doing before. Uh, someone said the only person sicker than a, than someone at their first AA meeting or first Al Anon meeting is that person's higher power. Uh, because our, under, our understanding of God, our understanding of a higher power, usually gets sick along with us. It isn't that God gets sick along with us. Our understanding gets perverted along with our disintegration in other departments. So that we come, and yet, even acknowledging that, that there's a... Um, uh, so we come with, with this. Our fears have a lot to do, and our frustrations have a lot to do with the negative notion of a higher power. Very often, in spite of that, we start with what we got. You know, you can't just make up one from scratch. You kind of link together. We, we, as we start to recover, our notion of a higher power recovers along with us. That's part of the thing. There's a so if you're, you know, if you had a uh, religious background where you're very much associated with the church, um, or your own prayer meditation thing is kind of strong, uh, or whether um, it's been disillusionment, or and that you've rejected all that, or or you never heard of it to begin with, um, we need almost certainly. As we begin our recovery, we need a fresh understanding and approach to faith. Because my understanding of our disease, the family disease, alcoholism or reacting to alcoholism, either, either way, when we're in that disease, we are trapped in self-will. We, we just can't help it. I mean, it isn't that we're we're just mean-spirited and selfish. It's that we're trying to survive. We're trying to get through the day. And if you're trying to get through the day as an alcoholic, you just got to get some things done. And it, you don't come up in your driveway just coming from the liquor store with a bottle in, your, in a paper sack and you're trying to get this in the house. And you don't come up in the driveway and say, well, higher power, if it be your will that I get this safely in the house and get to drink it, fine. Someone catches me and gets mad and empties it down the sink, well, thy will be done. Um, uh, uh, we don't have people reacting to other people's alcoholism without the program, say, before program, saying, well, you know, if they keep drinking and have to suffer a little more, and well, if, that, if, the, if in the mystery of the way you made human nature and this person, that's the way it's going to be, God bless them, thy will be done. Uh, if, uh, you know, we, we're not in a position to have sane attitudes when we're in an insane way of life. So we. We're playing catch-up ball, and we're playing emergency. It's emergency all the time. Uh, I gotta have this. I gotta have it. I gotta get the money. I, I gotta keep them from finding out. They can't find out. I gotta get it. I gotta. There's always this gotta gotta. And if we're in a gotta gotta way of life, then our understanding of a higher power usually deteriorates. Usually, we think of. Uh, our image of a God, if we're even bothering to think, is kind of a uh, an impersonal, 
Sometimes he helps you out, and sometimes he doesn't. Never can tell. Uh, batting about, you know, about one out of four times. Uh, God comes through. And uh, and it just seems like, well, why bother? It, whether you pray or not, you get about the same percentage. Um, when the prayer is, I gotta have this, I gotta, uh, that attitude, you know. Uh, when we're treating God, uh, really, the, when we're in our disease, or when we're in recovery and, and get old ideas, our notion of a higher power is that of the adversary. We have an adversarial relationship with God, and as we begin to recover, we are given an experience of God as ally. We start to experience our higher power as truly ally who's ahead of us. Um, part of the image of a higher power as adversary, it's uh, God, when we're not into it in the spirit of this program, a higher power is, is usually somebody that you're trying to have to keep up with you. God is kind of a big, dumb God. You've got to keep explaining things to him. Explaining a lot and cajoling and say, come on, come on. It's sort of the big fella in the sky you're pulling along to help you out with special jobs, you know. And um, that's, you know, the adversary. He's always slow on the pickup. Oh, oh is that what you wanted? Um, and the kind of faith that we begin to find here is just the opposite. It's, the, it's where our higher power is ahead of us. Uh, always giving us things that are so ahead of our understanding of what we need that we're receiving what we need for weeks and months before we figure out this is what I needed. Um, and there's, and it's always our higher power smarter than us instead of dumber and pulling along. It's kind of in the future and, and pulling us forward. Uh, and it's never answering our prayers the way we pray them because we pray our prayers with our old fearful mind. And our higher power is more merciful than to let us give instructions on exactly what the world needs in ourselves. If we had all of our prayers answered just the way we pray them, uh, we would be a true menace to the neighborhood. Uh, uh, we'd be, there wouldn't be a newcomer on the face of the earth that could talk to you. Uh, you'd be so good and perfect and poised and together you'd scare away anyone who is still having any problems. Um, they just take one look at you and resent you um, uh, for being so together. Uh, there's a an incident that uh, sort of a dis an awakening experience that's not mine. That's I, I share a lot in retreats and places. I haven't been here for a while. I certainly will share it. Uh, it came from a woman who has since died sober in the program. Her name was Gail, and a uh, very sharp lady. And she's, um, I heard this, she had this in a regular AA pitch uh, when I was, uh, I was quite new going to meetings myself. And she was telling her story, and kind of early in it, she just said that she, she was from the Midwest, and she was in the largest uh, subgroup in Alcoholics Anonymous, ex-Catholic. Um, she had moved out from this dull town in Kansas to um, California, and uh, she was on her own and got uh, a place to stay, a little apartment. And she said she got there, uh, finally, Liberty, you know, the big city away from these oppressive small town people. Um, and she said she was only sure of two things when she got to Los Angeles. One was that there was no God. And she forgets what the other thing was, to be sure. Um, and, uh, and as she, as she started out her thing, she had this little apartment with, uh, the four areas an apartment has. You know, this four area. Even if it's all kind of one room, it's at least areas of the room, but they usually have a bathroom and a little kitchen area. 
and then a bedroom, bed, oh, and then kind of a little living, little living room thing. Well, she had her four areas, and in her living room she had a green couch. Well, when she was first there, she said she did things pretty much in the four areas: food in the kitchen, the bathroom has its role, you sleep in the bedroom, and do some stuff in the living room. But as time went on, she spent more and more time on this green couch, drinking vodka, and she. And as time went on more, she began to spend just about all of her time on the green couch. And she gradually began to do on the green couch everything you do in the other rooms. Uh, uh, sleeping, stuff you do in the bathroom, any eating you do at the green couch. The green couch became a very unhealthy environment um, after a time. And the only time she'd leave the green couch was to make the run uh, and get back there with some vodka and her cigarette burn moo moo um, <laughs> hang out on the green couch and she was dying on the green couch and uh, alone and couldn't get off and was in despair and I forget the details of the 12 step call but somehow she made a call to somebody who called somebody who came over and she got to a meeting and I took her to a meeting and well she, the big deal was that she just didn't have a drink after her first meeting she was uh, goofy, and she didn't know which end was up, and, but she managed to get back there and just not have a drink, and uh, back and forth from meetings to this little place. And as time went on, she began to hear about higher power, faith, God, prayer, trust God. And she said, oh, no, because she had this thing she was sure of, that there was no God. And she so just put it on hold and off to the side. She liked the other part because she was starting to come alive a little bit. And so she kind of just kept this faith business to the side. And uh, and the weeks went by and the months went by. And she got more and more uncomfortable with all the pressure of the whole issue, uh, but didn't know what to do with it. Um, and it was so obvious to her there was no God. And uh, I think, I don't know how many, several months into recovering, and when she was starting to work again and got the place cleaned up and the green couch cleaned up and... Uh, uh, kind of rolling along, she said she she came in to her apartment and opened the door and took a few steps in and stopped. And it dawned on her who her higher power was. Her higher power was the one who keeps her off the green cup. She had an experience. She couldn't get off the green couch, but she was off and standing up and sober and kind of bright. And she. There was no accounting for how she got from there to here. And whatever the mystery was, it was some power greater than herself because it didn't even tire her out to make the trip. One of the ways you can tell when God's helping you is when you don't get tired from doing Like you accomplish more and do less or something like that. Um, there's a... Everybody here has a green cat star. Everybody here has experienced something like that. And there are some elements. I told her right after the beating, grabbed her, and I was very moved with that thing. And, and I said, you know, you're very Jewish. She looked at me. Didn't look offended, but she looked puzzled. Um, I said, uh, I said that's, your story about the green couch is, is an exact parallel of the Exodus story. Uh, it's being in slavery in Egypt and crying out, and then getting help that you didn't want. Uh, 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 it's, in Egypt, what they wanted was straw for the bricks and better food. Instead, they got someone who came along and said, I'd like you to leave this country uh, and to go to a promise line and start something completely new and different and fresh and a new relationship. Well, all, uh, wait a minute. We weren't well, it's this or nothing. Uh, and then off you go. And in the middle of getting helped by this higher power, you're in the middle of the desert. You're sitting in a Al-Anon meeting with someone going on and on. And you're wondering, is this rescue? Uh, uh, you know, you're not so sure that this is... Even what you, it's not what you asked for. You're not quite so sure it's what you wanted. 
but it's definitely a lot better than it was before. Uh, as a characteristic, see, any contact with a higher power that's in the tradition of the faith that's mentioned in the 12 steps, in the tradition of the Judeo-Christian faith experience, that's in the tradition of the faith of Islam, uh, faith of, uh, and, the, and Buddhism has this in common. The, the great spiritual traditions are everybody's spiritual awakening and the trip always involves transformation, transformation. It's never a matter of, of having a big dumb God that you've got to explain a lot of things to and cajole into doing what you want. Uh, it's always a higher power who transforms our minds, transforms our hearts so that we're taught want what we truly need, and we were too sick and hurting to know what to want. Uh, and it was always something, you know, short term and anything to stop the pain, stop the flow of blood. Um, and But we're, no, no, no. Our higher power, the creator, the one, the, the source of love and wisdom, you know, wants the best for us. And instead of letting us set the term, uh, instead of letting the sick one explain to the well one how to take care of them. This, we alcoholics are notorious, and al the same. We're notorious for explaining to people ready to help us what they should do to help us. The, uh, you know, I get a chance as a, as a clergyman in the, having people come to talk to me in a parish setting over the years. I've had a lot more people who need Al-Anon come to talk to me than who need, because the alcoholics don't come to the rectory. Uh, uh, Sometimes, but mostly it's somebody, a relative comes to enlist me into the plot uh, of how to cure this other person. And, um, And so what I have is someone coming to give me instructions on how to help them from a diseased mind. And uh, and the best help I can give, of course, is to refuse to let that person set the agenda. And people get very upset when you will not go along with their agenda. Uh, and this is, this is why the second step is after the first step. <laughs> this is why we don't start out with faith. Because we can't get into a fresh faith unless we hit bottom, unless we get so shaken, unless the rope is is yanked out of our hands with our fingernails still in it, and somehow our own agenda has to be destroyed, our own nitpicky, self-centered, pathetically narrow way of getting it together. Uh... We have to be so discouraged from having that work that we actually lose interest in it or or just kind of know it won't work to create a little opening, a little opening for a really fresh beginning. And that happened to Gail. Okay? She was so out of it that she her agenda was to get so, figure out how to drink and not get into trouble. Well, she was beyond that. And so she was given another help, a character, some characteristics of, if you want to know if you're being helped by a higher power, one is that our higher power seems to be very little interested in pandering to our ego needs. <laughs> uh, usually when you get help by God, it, you don't look particularly better after the help. Um, <laughs> You, <laughs> you know, you probably cry more after the help, and uh, and your um, and the view from within is is interesting. Uh, that when we're being helped by God, usually instead of getting rid of the of the limitations, the pain, the character defects, the the frustrations that are within us, what we want is, please get rid of that stuff. Help me out of this. Get over it. Um, and instead of getting rid of it, 
we we get help where we're drawn into life so that we can we don't suffer the same frustration the same way but instead of kind of turning out nice we notice our character defects a lot more clearly than ever before alcoholics are barely alcoholic when they get to AA barely you know? With God's help, you become really alcoholic. You know? uh, and al and we might be a little bit self-centered when we get here. So I admit, I haven't been the most generous person in the world. But with God's help, we realize we are pathetically self-centered. Where we're, it's comical, uh, the way I refer all things to myself. You know, in the middle of the most generous helping of others, I stopped to pose for pictures. Um, uh, yeah, wondering how I go. Um, I mean, it's, and if and when you've gone come to a, Al-Anon, you know, you just yeah, you're a little maybe there's a little bit of manipulation in your life. You admit that, and then with God's help, you find out that. You've been scheming manipulation most of your waking hours you know, for uh, for years. It's been just a, a preoccupying, all day long, churning plot of uh, how to control your environment, um, the people in it. And so, in a way, as we're helped by God, our egos are not exalted, they're, and they're not crushed. In the opposite of being exalted, we're not demeaned and put down, and we're not saying, "Oh, you're wonderful and cute, and you're just fine." It's something else that happens that we we meet um, we meet a mature person. We meet somebody who looks right at us and sees who we are, and says, "And this, of course, the message is given from God through people we meet in the program, and the people look at us, and we're." in dread of being put down and looked down on and despised. And we're just hoping that people will think we're cute and wonderful and just fine. <laughs> and they don't do either one. They look at us and say, oh, you're such a mess. Uh, <laughs> we're really glad you came to this meeting. Uh, keep coming. And they give you a hug and have total acceptance and affirmation and say, you know, whatever you do, please come back to this meeting. Uh, because, you know, you're a danger to the community uh, in the way you are. Um, and so we get this different thing, you know. We weren't even looking for that favor of being accepted and critically and unconditionally while with eyes open about our, our suffering and our character defects. It didn't even occur to us that that's the way, because we've been living in fear. And when we live in fear, that there's no place for that. You see, well, we have to come to a place, fear, to live in fear, is to live with the conviction that God or somebody or they are waiting to judge you, are waiting to evaluate you, and then reject you insofar as they find things wrong with you. And the, the the revelation of a higher power, the revelation of God comes by the discovery that nobody's after us to judge us. It's just, they're just not there. Uh, what's after us is, um, well, it's, I mean, why say the judge is after us? We're judged. You know, we're judged with love. Uh, what we dread is a rejecting judgment. And what we meet is that mature love of God that is reflected in people who are mature. The people who are who grow up with a measure of faith and, and are kind of seasoned in treating people well and learning how to love well, those people have that characteristic. The characteristic of a good sponsor. In fact, my my image of a higher power more and more is that of the like the ultimate sponsor. But the any a regular old sponsor will have two characteristics in the way they treat you 
that are in seeming contradiction. The whole program has a way of treating you that has two characteristics that are in seeming contradiction that I've already mentioned, and I'll mention them again. One is that they accept you unconditionally. It doesn't matter what your record is. It doesn't matter whether you're clinging to a bunch of nonsense right now uh, and you're you're uh you know you just feel pretty unhappy and negative about the way you have you haven't solved a lot of your problems and the way people are bad to you are and you don't see much prospect of a changing in your way either so what is everybody so happy about around here um and you have a sponsor who would who would say, "Oh my dear, you know come in you know, but don't go away please and uh you all, and sometimes you when you break through and finally confide in your sponsor and say a few things that you just were dreading anyone would ever find out. And then when your sponsor just nonchalantly says, uh-huh, yeah. Yeah, I do that a lot myself. Um, and you almost want to make stuff up to test it. Uh, uh, and the, there's that quality then there is the quality of them not letting you get away with the thing. I mean, how can they have all of this tolerance and acceptance and then just be nail you on the smallest thing? I mean, you just begin to explain why you're having such a rough day because you have a boss that's truly malicious and incompetent. Um, and that's why life is miserable. And you're, but instead of saying, oh, I understand, it's really rough, they'll say, well, you know, resentment's our number one offender, uh, and it can get you drunk if you cling to resentments against people. And self-pity dies hard. <laughs> um, uh, and it's, it's an inside job, remember? It's all this stuff that just puts it right back on us. Uh, and then they're they're smiling and loving to you as they nail you, and, you know, uh, and of course that that kind of loving judgment is something that can be hard to take, but it's very bracing. It, it is t- totally different than the than the rejecting judgment of fear. Um, now the whole the program as a whole begins to treat us that way. Um, it changes, the program as a whole has a way of treating us like a higher power treats us. Like it just will, will not accept our agenda. We come in here with an agenda, they say, we'd like you to drop your whole agenda, please. And sit down and shut up and listen. You know? You, know, you attract a lot of people this way, huh? Yeah. Um, and the, that's why the second step comes after the first. Somehow our agenda has to be really destroyed or, or wounded badly. Like we don't have much bright ideas left. Um, and the this is a characteristic of a, of beginning to find this relationship to a higher power, um, and that is. That, again, there's just paradoxes all over the place here. But one of the paradoxes of coming to faith is that we are, we're surprised, we're drawn in to receiving some help that we kind of question in a way, because it isn't what we had in mind. And on the other hand, it's helping us more than the help would have helped that we had in mind. And, well, it's good, and it's really neat, but, uh, and we're, and we're challenged to start trusting that, see? To say, if you want more of this, I'd like you to sign your name. And sign your name to the second step. Came to believe that a power greater than your, our, yourself is restoring us to sanity. It's saying, will you agree you're being restored to health? Will you agree there's a new help coming in your life that's ahead of you, that's uh, surprising you, 
that you can't control yeah, in many ways. We're going to judge them with rejecting judgment, which doesn't hurt anybody, which doesn't help anybody. But to acknowledge, that's a lot of the healing in ACA, is, is to get it straight. Uh, what happened and, and how I had a need to pretend I wasn't hurt in, in order to survive at the time. We get that straightened out. But we, if we're working the program and the steps, we'll keep moving ahead. And as we acknowledge that, we acknowledge our part. And you say, what do you mean our part? When you're a little kid, um, you know, you're going to blame yourself for being negative after they beat you up. You're going to blame yourself for being an iceberg and, and distant after you were sexually abused. You know, why do that? It's their fault. Fear. That's fear talking. There's no healing going on there. I have a little list of things that, um, you see, the, the thing is, when we write down our inventory, our part in the transaction, we're not writing down what we deserve blame for. There's no deserve blame left. There's only a searching for healing and integral that we cannot be healed unless we take responsibility for our lives. If we own our own feelings and own what we do and kind of stand up with the, with the trust that we're accepted in this group by God and other people and people will help us walk through and get free of the ways we handle things. For example, it can be something that isn't a sin or at all. If you, if, well, you're abused. You, you were the one they hurt. What did you put in your inventory? Well, acknowledge you've been hurt as best you can. But it's straight. But then acknowledging your own part. We might say, I acknowledge that I burdened others with the obligation of making me happy. <laughs> I just, uh, decided that they had to treat me right, or I would never be happy, and it's their fault. Um, Nobody can make us happy. One of the ways we can tell we've assigned someone else the job of making us happy is when we're very deeply disappointed or resentful of the other person. We're holding it against them. God damn it. Um, we're, we're, that person hurts you. That isn't funny. But you acknowledge your hurt and reach, okay, what does a person do after they're hurt that way? Well, they have to acknowledge it. Maybe they have to even tell the person. But we don't have to get them to apologize or change. And we don't have to roll back history and have it not happen. The program says, we, nobody can stop you from working your program and having a life. Nobody. And we don't have to have rejecting judgment on anyone else. And we're not in the business of they're getting blameworthy stuff for ourselves. But to say, uh, yeah, I, uh, I'll, I'll combine this, this two. I kind of made a distinction. Maybe they can emerge. But the number two was, we acknowledge that we mess back when they mess with us. <laughs> uh, you say, well, why should I even mention that? That's so little, you know. I mean, the way I was treated, hardly blame anybody for being distant and negative. Nobody's blaming. But if you are distant and negative as a way of coping and avoiding hurt, you have hurt yourself a lot. And you're in the habit of hurting yourself a lot. And if you can say that's what you're doing, you're one step closer to being free, set free from that behavior. It's nothing to do with blaming you. That's the way an inventory heals. Also good to acknowledge resentments we have uh, against God. I, I, resent, I found out that I resented God for two reasons. I resented Him for not making me turn out better. And I resented Him for not giving me a bigger payoff for my compliance. <laughs> No. I went to the seminary early and I was a good boy. Now, 
you know, make me good and make me you know, it's a reward. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a self-centered kind of attitude. Um, nobody's blaming me and putting me down for being kind of mad at God for not making me turn out better. That's what happens if you get the get a basic misunderstanding about what the deal is with God. You know, I thought the deal was, you know, that I'd get over everything and finally be all right and have everybody look up to me forever. Um, you can see how this is a... It's the very heart of this is transformation. Um, the woman... Um, very touching to me, this uh, story of a gal who uh, heard this in a pitch, 10-minute pitch. She gave it a convention. I don't remember the long pitch at all. But her, her sharing really knocked me out. Uh, and in this very brief sharing, she, she talked about uh, getting sober. And then once she got a little stabilized and started getting the program, talking to a sponsor, she talked about her the way she resented her father. She said, my father was so bad. He, he was so cruel and he abused me so much that no way. I mean, me, drop, he's a bastard. And the sponsor said, ask God to help you let it go. And she wouldn't even cooperate with that for a little while. And finally, with the, the, the negative feelings, she thought, well, okay, I'll give it a shot. So she said, okay, I'll let go of the resentment. Then it didn't go. Stuck. Then she um, said, well, I guess you're going to have to pray for him. Pray for him? So the big book suggests we pray for somebody. So she prayed for him. The resentment stayed. Pray for him as you would a sick friend. Prayed, still resented her. The sponsor said, okay, after a few more months of that, you'll have to escalate this to the next stage. Now, what is that? You're going to have to treat him decently. No, no, not that. Uh, <laughs> he lived in the same town still. He was in contact with the family. And she'd see him once in a while. Couldn't avoid it. She'd saw everybody else. She says, you don't have to pretend you like him. You don't have just treat him decently. Don't put out negative stuff. If you find it very difficult, but at least be civil and do things decent to him. She'd already done her foot. I think she said to him that, you know, she was hurt and that it didn't work. You know, I mean, he didn't respond very well. Okay, so she went on the, okay, under the heading of treating him decently meant sending him a birthday card, Christmas card, and saying hello when she met him. So she did that for about four years and felt a resentment. He finally got sick and went to the hospital for some surgery or other. And he was in the hospital and she thought, well, under the heading of treating him decent, I guess that means I have to go by with a card or a flower or something. And so she went by and did her duty, walked in, put the thing down, said hello. Hope it get better. Without much feeling, and went down and she said she was getting into her car and realized the resentment was gone. She was in touch with his humanity at last and was no longer under the oppression of his own illness. Her father was sick and couldn't love and lashed out in ways were, that were awful, but she was set free from his illness by working this program. It's not that we let people off the hook and mollify and say, oh, it wasn't so bad. Nothing to do with that. It's cooperating with God to set us free from other people's emotional domination of our lives by keeping us negative. You see how different this is? This is prayerful. This is honest. This requires an atmosphere in which we are given assurance that we're not blamed and rejected. And that it's not, it isn't even to our interest to find out we're innocent. You know, you don't get any points for being innocent. 
You don't get any points for saving God the trouble of healing you. You don't get any... It's just a matter of getting to the truth. Getting to what in us is causing us to snuff out life. What in us is is walling me off from being in touch with the humanity of somebody. What in me is preventing me... What in, what in me and my attitude and things I'm... Memories and the things I'm holding makes me still vulnerable to the cruelty of another person who lives far away. Or I'm still churning about them. And the the big book says, we have a program that will give you healing from that. And it doesn't come at our time and just the way we want to. Sometimes it'll be five years, even while we're applying ourselves steadily. But you know that person, that, that woman who did that thing with her father, if she did that for five years, she's working a hell of a program. And she was still bedeviled by that, and it was still kind of a pain. But still there was a, she was going in the direction. And the whole thing is not the result, but that we go in the right direction. Um, again, the, uh, so sex relationships are a, you know, a good field for just mentioning how the transformation is the big thing, the transformation of attitude from defensiveness, fear, and self-contempt you know, over to faith. Um, because when we're, uh, say, do the, the sex inventory or a relationship inventory where there's... Uh, you know, the things we look at, I, I find that... Uh, being a Catholic and being a professional Catholic, I uh, I studied morality rather closely. I got down to every... I probably know the names of more sins than you do. Um, and um, I know... I know all kinds of ways of sin. Um, and the... The big book, when it does the, um, does, gets a couple pages of commentary on making an inventory of our lives in the sex area, it says we treat sex as we would any other issue, any other problem. And we treat relationships that are sexual in nature kind of the way we treat other relationships. In other words, what we ask is, how have I hurt others or hurt myself? Rather than, what gradation of sin did I commit and how much danger am I in? You know, which could be the, you know, the, the, the self-centered, pious person's thing of getting obsessed with my standing and how guilty I am or not, which is a, a very unloving thing, you know, a very inconsiderate thing. And the big book's a good guide for that. The, um, uh, just a few comments on different, uh, aspects of uh, relationships. One, a marriage relationship. Um, <laughs> you know, the most god-awful surrender is necessary for two people to be able to stand each other in close quarters. Um, uh, the, um, you know, I'll never forget the talking to several couples in a row on a couple's retreat. The first retreat I ever did in and I, it's an annual thing, and a lot of the couples keep coming back, and and these are not young couples. Um, these are not couples with unstable marriages. Uh, they started out with a doctor and his wife, and there was a bunch of other doctors, the seven doctors and their wives, as I call it. And then over the years, they were added and changed, but there were a few of the originals. One year, I third, third or fourth year in doing this, several couples came in to talk to me. And they were married in an average of 35 years. And we're, we're talking about divorce or separation. That wasn't the issue. They had some, something in their relationship they wanted to discuss. And that was, well, they were stable. You know? They were sober, long-term members of the program. And after I talked to three couples in a row of uh, long-term successful marriages, I was in awe at the depth of pain in a happy marriage. (laughs) 
that the the (laughs) Jean Vanier, a spiritual writer that I I admire a lot. He's he's living. He's a French Frenchman who started all this chain of resonances for developmentally disabled people. Very spiritual guy, and he wrote a thing with on on sex and marriage and one of his things comments about marriage is the the mo the special mode of married love is forgiveness. Doesn't mean you do a bad program and let someone walk all over you and be a doormat. No, no. It's just continuous forgiveness is necessary to keep the ship afloat. Um you know, I think a happy marriage is one in which the couple the husband and wife love each other are glad they're married to each other, but really miss each other if they were separated and can barely stand each other. Uh, uh, in the, there's, just, there's just something about a person who refuses to get out of your face. You know, They won't go home. Uh, <laughs> it's because they are home. <laughs> And the the surrender of letting another person be, and it, uh, I think that surrender can be expressed in the mode of forgiveness a lot. Forgiving them just for being there, forgiving them for uh, forgiving them for the the way they won't wise up ever. You know, forgive us, forgive us. You can say anything you want, be honest, but there's an element of of a decision. You know? We kind of have the we have a choice of whether or not to forgive the person's presence. And uh and you forgive their presence and forgive this and forgive that. And you can be honest. Say anything you want. Make your complaint. And turn over the results of the complaint. And of course the thing I mentioned earlier what happens when we do totally forgive and turn over, and that is the goodness of that person becomes available to us again. Uh and there can be some fun, you know. Uh but that, and so in our in inventory, uh, there can be, especially from the al point of view, it's very difficult. I think it's out, much harder for al to take an inventory, even though we alcoholics can't remember half of what we did. Um, it's hard because there's so much injury done unto a person who comes to al as such horrendous inconsideration, you know, and, and, and sensitive, boorish, overbearing, betrayals and everything. And <laughs> I'm I'm getting into it, right? Yeah, yeah. Um <laughs> and the um uh, and the of course it it takes you know getting into the program, you know, to make the distinction between not being a doormat and standing up for yourself and while standing up for oneself and being honest to forgive. That's a distinction we can make well only when we're surrounded by people working the program. We need a lot of support to kind of understand. And so what we put in our inventory, um, well, I didn't forgive a lot. I, you know, and again, we say, I didn't forgive this person that was hurting me. That's not my fault. No one says it's your fault. No one's blaming you. But if you get into the habit of being having hardness of heart and protecting yourself by being tough in that manner, well, then you just get a little too tough. A little too tough for your own good. And you just get so tough that there's no comfort can get through the defense to, to, to touch your heart and uh, be a solid. Uh, so we, we write down, didn't harden held things against them and was was cold and distant. That doesn't mean you're taking the blame because there's no blame. Um, funny, you know, in the boyfriend-girlfriend or boyfriend-boyfriend-girlfriend-girlfriend uh, relationship, uh, what an aspect of the courting or the going out with somebody that kind of tickles me, it's funny, but it's tragic, is... Um, there seems to be social permission to lie 
and deceive and manipulate anybody that you have a chance of having a sexual relationship with. And you're supposed to be honest and considerate and respectful of everybody else. But if there's a chance, you're kind of allowed to lie in order to make a good impression. So it'll work. Did you know? Do we? There's something about the social permission. And I think that uh, uh, has to be kind of looked at. The... Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think, um, you know, in relationships that are, that have some social stigma connected, um, there's a, there's a mild stigma, I guess, connected with living one another without being married. Stigma connected with some, with gay relationships. And whenever there's a little bit of a social stigma, it adds a lot to defensiveness. There's a thing, well, that's not wrong. Well, if someone is accusing us, then we, we tend to get defensive. And one thing about the, the, whole, the program, 12 steps, leads us always to a point where we don't have to be defensive. Where we can honestly just, God, please help me see what I'm really up to and really doing and what my intentions are and let me know if, I, how, if I'm hurting myself or others. Because nobody's really blaming us. And so I think when it comes to a relationship, say long-term relationships that are irregular in some way, uh, by society standards, they're still, in our inventory, we look, what's the bottom line here? Uh, not what do they say, how am I experiencing this? What do I say? What's my own conscience? Um, uh, and I think a guide to examining a relationship that's sexual is to take out the sex and say, how do you treat the person as a person if you disregard the sex altogether? And that tells us how we're treating a person as a person. Are we, there's a necessity of radical surrender, of being willing for a person to either love us or not love us or make a decision to go where they want to go or not where you are honest about what you'd like, but you have to let the person grant them their freedom. Or we manipulate it and don't treat the person right. It's, it's not good manners. <laughs> it backfires. Um, the uh, transformation that the program offers us is especially apparent in uh, behavior that uh, we would kind of all, that most people agree is, ooh, pretty destructive. Uh, behavior that's in the sexual area that's, uh, I'd say, very promiscuous behavior where there's a lot of sex that's really impersonal practically, or um, uh, so the kind of behavior that goes along with drinking a lot, you know. And we can say, if there's fear, there's either a bunch of excuses or utter shame and contempt. And if there's faith, there's the attitude that, you know, if you have sex with a lot of different people and you're not ready, you sure have to lie a lot. And there's something about sex where you know, there's a God-givenness to the whole operation where it seems there's a sort of a built-in message. And uh, two people can be agreed that they're not, this is no big deal, this isn't the answer, we're not going to be a couple, but just uh, after a bunch of dinner, though. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, and there may be an agreement that there's, you know, but there's a certain, like, nature, a, there's a certain given about the message of sexual intercourse. And the given is just, it is a symbolic way of saying, we're in this together. And I care about your whole life, but I kind of care where your laundry is done and what your plans are and how your taxes are doing. And, uh, 
It implicitly says that. You didn't realize that, but it implicitly... <laughs> and when the, end, the endocrine system gets secreting certain uh, little chemical messages that go out to the body, and the whole body gets ready to have some security and have some place to rest your head where they don't move fast and drop it. <laughs> there's a... And whether there's... It doesn't matter whether anybody means this or not. The whole system gets ready for some kind of intimacy and love and tenderness. And, uh, and then when it doesn't happen, it's like getting your chin dropped on cement. And so it's tough. And if a person looks at their own life, say, with insufficient preparation or, or whatever, wasn't personal enough and says, you know, uh, there was some damage to me and other people, and I want to acknowledge that. No defensiveness, no contempt for oneself. So you're in a faith that can be that way, and then we can talk in a way that's healing and not just circular. You know? um, we started a little late, and I went a little late. Um, I should stop. Uh, usually I stop just before I say anything about sex. When we get, uh, I'm an alcoholic. When I drink, I ask alcohol to take care of me the way only a higher power can take care of me. I ask it to do it for me. Don't ask it to make me happy. I ask it to take care of me during this hour when I'm high. I, and then so far as I have a belief in control, I ask my powers of manipulation to take care of me. My, my power to, to weasel and evoke sympathy and scare you and convince you and be quicker than. I rely on my powers of persuasion to change you enough so that you'll be good enough to me so that I can make it through the day. I'll rely on that. And the 12 steps say, we'd like you to rely on a power of love and wisdom that manifests itself when you work the steps and live in the fellowship. It isn't that you don't think anymore or persuade or, or do, you can try to persuade people, fine, then turn over results. You know? uh, but you don't count on, you don't count on getting the results. Whenever we are dealing with, whenever we're using idols, using money or alcohol or sex or persuasion, when we start counting on those things, relying on those things so that we can make it, we always have the results in mind. It's always result or keyed on results. I'm relying on this so that I get the result, so that I'll get high enough so that I'm immune from you getting me. Uh, I want the result. And in this thing of faith, it says we'd like you to uh, we'd like you to come forward and enter into this way of life where we start treasuring the kind of relationship we're given, a relationship that that's based on mutual respect and honesty about what's wrong with us, and learning how to tell the truth and rely on that way of life primarily. And then even give up the results. And then you'll get results that are a lot better ever by miles than when you wouldn't give up the results. Uh, and here I, I wanted to make, I'm getting off to the point that's almost escaping me here, and that is, it's strange. But as we give ourselves in faith, we say, okay, I'll buy into this. I'm going to sign this. I believe that a power greater than myself is restoring me to sanity. As we give ourselves over to a relationship to a higher power, to the universe, that's different than this working it out in private that we've been doing for so many years, it seems like you would give yourself away and somehow your own dignity as an independent person would suffer. And it's just the opposite. 
how that we do not turn ourselves into a Jim Jones kind of thing. We don't turn ourselves in and abdicate responsibility for our lives. Faith doesn't work that way. We are walking the path of faith, and what happens is it wakes us up more, and we become more alert to what in the heck is really going on around us. And we notice people easier. And we start getting a little better judgment about what it is we do that hurts and what it is we do that helps. Uh, and we actually it, become more independent and responsible. And it's up to us to make our decisions and what we do next. Uh, it's a strange thing, isn't it? You'd think you'd be more responsible when you're just off by yourself alone and you're by golly, I'm doing it. I'm t- taking care of myself. Um, and what we're in is in, in, in a secret, weirdo relationship with a weirdo relationship with alcohol or, or pills that I have this pact that I have to get enough for you to take care of me and I have to be sure no one knows about this because it's harder to get the stuff when they know. Um, and then my relationship with everyone else is really screwed up. Uh, and that relationship to a power greater than ourselves in the tradition of the 12 steps actually brings us out into the community and turns the lights on. And our relationships are much more simple and honest with everybody. And we have a chance to be responsible and independent and not abdicate our... It's really... I mean, I can't explain that. I can kind of describe it a little bit. And as it happens to you, you kind of know. Now, kind of a theme here, and the point of the second step, that as, if you're rejoicing right now and kind of a fresh faith in your life, and and, and before I say, just kind of you know, do the final bit, you say, yeah, right on. Uh, or if you're, if this is a real tough thing for you, you just... <sighs> They bring up faith in God. He kind of grinds you a bit. And uh, because you want, it's so bad. And yet it doesn't seem to be working. Um, one point, uh, of a theme point I want, that I've been trying to make is that we don't figure out a faith. We, we let the experiences that some higher power gives us, draws us into as we begin recovery. We need to be taught by our own experiences. And if you identified with much of what I said at all about being drawn into the program and then being given some help that you weren't even interested in and not given the help you wanted, and another characteristic of God's help is that it always puts you in better shape to relate to other human beings. When you're helped by God, you're a better person to be around. You may not look any better. You may be much more aware of your own goofiness, but you're you're better to other people. You're better at it, of being. Uh, you're better at loving. You know? And usually, when we're hurting real bad, we're not asking higher power, please make me a little more kind and loving, so I can. That way, I'll probably. People don't pray that way when we're in the middle of our disease. Please make them nicer to me and get them off my back and let me not be so sick. Uh, so we have these In other words, look to the experience. We have a wealth of spiritual awakening going on. Look to the... And, and when you listen to other people and their stories, listen especially for the way they've been touched in a new faith. Because if you listen hard for that, you will hear your own experience. We have things happen to us that we don't have words for. And the experience kind of sits there in co-ace, you know, not understood and not described. And it kind of takes us identifying with other people for this to kind of come alive and start being more of, take up more room within us. Um, my time has been up for a few minutes. So I stop. Turn this off. This is the end of Session 2, the start of Session 3. I invite everyone to mosey toward a seat. 
and uh, find your little, find your niche. Oh, the table's in here already. Oh, drawing off, yeah. Um, oh, we're going to warm up with the announcements a little bit. Remind you that those who sign up to talk one-on-one, -on -one, it's right over there at the chapel, and the door is at this end of the chapel, kind of in the back of the nearest door you can find to the right. Um, part of the thing is after this session and we have our next chairing meeting, that you have the longest break. It's, uh, you have several hours there. Two hours? Well, two and a half. Um, and uh, I want to encourage you to you know, make the most of your alone time. And the, it, sometimes we have to plan a little bit to make a decision to uh, see to it that we're alone for at least an hour so you can have that way of being for a while. And sometimes I don't when I find myself in similar circumstances, I'll just kind of drift into one conversation after another, and it's all over, and I'm tired. Um, so if you plan a little time to rest up, go to sleep, or hide out, go for a walk, uh, whatever you want to do. Whatever seems good to you, you just think ahead. The other thing is that I will, um, I plan to celebrate Mass in this room at 5 o'clock. And I, we brought the table, the table that will be the altar in to dry out, kind of waterlogged, and uh, get a little cloth over it. And uh, at Mass, it's, it's an optional thing for a retreat. This is a, you know, an uh, interdenominational, non-denominational retreat. And so, uh, but Mass is a Roman Catholic Christian thing. So, if you want to attend, everyone's invited to attend that. They're formally invited if you're uncomfortable with the whole notion, uh, then don't go to it. Be comfortable someplace. Uh, but just uh, a couple of aspects of it. I just want to mention that it's going to be, um, it is important that we have a little kind of a sacred space for it. So if you're going to not a, be at it, I would ask you not to kind of hang around the other places you know, where it would be harder to for noise and stuff like that. Um, and some people ask about uh, receiving Holy Communion, if that's appropriate. You know, for, well, in principle, everyone in the world is invited to receive communion. Because it's, um, it's only appropriate to say that the me part, part of the meaning of receiving communion is that that's your faith. That you believe in Jesus Christ and, you, and that it's part of the expression of that faith is this uh, sacrament of the Lord's Supper, Mass, and that... Uh, and it's a way of joining up. It's a sacrament of initiation. So if, so if you're a visitor and you're kind of thinking, look this over, well, then it would not be appropriate to receive because it's, it's a sign you're joining up the community and you're part of that. Community. Um, but you're very welcome to absolutely be here. You're welcome to receive communion. You've got to step forward and uh, maybe, but if you're not ready to kind of be part of it today, then it would be later you do that. Um, uh, People uh, ask, you know, other religions, is that there's no official intercommunion between Christian religions yet. They haven't worked that out. Um, and um, if that's part of your, if that's part of your faith, though, I'm very comfortable with people having an unofficial intercommunion, and, uh, and welcome you to make up your mind and welcome you to be here and prayerfully join in the spirit of the prayer and sharing. If I say any more, we'll get a major, you'll get a credit for theology. Uh, uh, with that, uh, I hope you're not, this isn't on the tape, is it? We're not taping yet, are we? Uh, let's pray the serenity for God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. I'd like to share a bit about the notion of surrender. The third step, made a decision to turn our life and our will over to the care of God as we understand it. 
Um, this is the heart of uh, the spiritual life and recovery, and it's uh, and I always scratch around for a way to start out because it's so interesting. There's so many angles on this thing. Um, and what occurred to me today is the you know the, the big it's a revolutionary step. Uh, totally. And when I first hear surrender, believe me, I sure don't. When I first read the third step and gave it some thought. Uh, I sure didn't get it straight by what they meant. And I'm somebody with upper division credits. <laughs> and surrender. I studied surrender professionally before I uh, drank. There's a um, department of theology called ascetical theology and it has to do with the principles of becoming a saint. How to Principles of sanctity and uh, surrender and giving oneself over to higher power and living in that relationship totally in a receiving way. Anything you say, higher power, any suggestions? I'm ready for the will of God to be the, the main thing. That's the heart of it. And, um, and I just didn't get it. When I'd read the surrender step, it seemed to me that what they were doing was trying to make it palatable. The bad news, palatable. You know, trying to say, well, you must surrender. But what they meant was, the fun is over. Uh, that time to start getting serious and keeping all the resolutions you could never keep. Doing it right. Shape up. No more messing around. Um, and yes, we'll say surrender and make it sound like that was the impression I'd receive after my graduate course. Because I, I had my eye, it was affected by fear in a way I did not understand, and I had my eye on results. Results, results, results. And this surrender that we're invited to. What our higher power does here is invites us into taking the third step and says, I, in effect, if I might paraphrase what I think my higher power is saying to me, he's saying, I got good news for you. I'm going to let you off the hook. You've been torturing yourself. You got yourself in a double bind, a no-win proposition, day in and day out. You've assigned yourself the task of becoming happy and fulfilled by getting your own way a lot. <laughs> and you can't get your own way enough to be happy and fulfilled if that's the standard of happiness and fulfillment, is getting your own way a lot. You just get frustrated too much. You can't get them to cooperate. You can't get your own insides to cooperate enough. you got enough hang-ups and defects of character, and they won't... They're not too anxious to to get into your program and to cooperate with you. And so you've got yourself a possible assignment. Learn how to drink right. Learn how to drink with... And I'm going to let you off the hook and show you a way to live with some inner peace and harmony, with maximum harmony with your fellows, your brothers and sisters, uh, where you don't have to condemn yourself to this kind of frustration. Is that good news? That's what I consider surrender to be. We're invited into this. He says, come forward. And he says, turn your life and your will over to the care of God. And that sounds so religious, so spiritual, uh, beyond uh, what it says. If you do that, you're pretty sure it'll jeopardize your financial and sex life a lot. You know, that you're... <laughs> You know, from what you know of God, he has not been interested in in seeing you get more money or sex. And um, that probably won't be part of the program. Um, and so we, again, the results thing. Now, uh, but we still are drawn forward because that's the, that's the logical place to be. We hit bottom and realize that we are being helped out. Realize we're being helped enough 
to start having a faith in a power greater than ourselves. And this um, surrender, uh, and again, back to the... We, see, we look at everything and out of the window that we're accustomed to looking out of. The window I'm most, I've done most of my looking from is the window of fear. The window where I'm threatened, I'm, I'm just pretty anxious that people think well of me to reassure me I'm all right. And I'm anxious that um, uh, you know, that I get a good rating, uh, so that at least I'm above average <laughs> in most respects. Um, I'm anxious that I not be bereft and left alone, and I get my turn, <laughs> and I have a little fun, and of course be spiritual and um, generous and rich. Um, <laughs> pretty important to have these things and have a relationship that fulfills me. A relationship. And uh, the uh, our higher power is saying, look, I, I have to ask you to simply realize that as you look out of that window, you will remain frustrated forever. I want you to look out of a different window. Uh, look out of the window where you're invited not to be the center of the universe, embattled, uh, worried about critics um, and those against you, and those frustrating you, but to look out of the window where you are one of God's children. You are loved by your higher power. You're one of God's children, and you're not the center of the universe. And that's going to let you off the hook. See, while I'm the center of the universe, everybody's my adversary because you're. The only way you can be good unto me is by cooperating with my version of being the center. And uh, when I'm not the center, but when I'm on the, when I'm kind of holding hands, this is the way I do after a meeting, and forming a circle around a higher power, and I'm one of the folks, I realize that uh, I don't have to have things, quote, turn out uh, all the time. And that's the, the break, the breaking in of this new thing. Um, I can't emphasize too much that it's always transformation. It, it's doing it in a radically different way. That's what surrender invites us to do. Uh, now, the minute we get into a bit of surrender, um, Let me describe surrender on the on the three levels first. Um, surrender is a is affirming our relationship to a higher power, saying, "God, you're God, and I'm not. Uh, I'm one of the folks, um, and I'm uh, and I want to learn to live in. You know, what do you do to live? See, that's the surrender question." The non-surrender question is, how do I get it? How do I get the result I know I've got to have? How do I get, how do I lose weight, stop drinking, get more money, have a better relationship, and get it all nailed down? How do I get that? And it is, we'll just have to ask you to stop asking that. We'll have to ask you to stop and ask a different would like you to ask, what do I do next to live in harmony as a child of God? What do I do to make it around here? Aha! Now, now there's something possible, see? Because we can't achieve results. They say, well, one of the things you do is uh, show up at meetings <laughs> and uh, be open for identification. And uh, when you find yourself identifying with somebody, we'd like you to know that that doesn't threaten your life and that's all right. When you identify with other alcoholics and say, oh my God, I'm more of an alcoholic than I thought. Um, but that's, don't worry about that, that's good. You identify more. And let's say you uh, find yourself not worried about results, but you're, again, we get freedom and straight. 
our higher power kind of draws us into surrender on many levels. And then he asks us to affirm, to sign our name to it later. I found that my basic surrender, I stumbled into. I think maybe most people do, but I stumbled into the first, to the beginning of real surrender. I'd been hospitalized five times in an aversion treatment hospital, once in a psychiatric division of a major hospital, and then shipped to New Jersey. Um, they weren't waiting with bated breath in Los Angeles to see how I'd do. Um, after multiple hospitalizations, they're not waiting anymore to find out. We're written off, kind of healthy in a way. Um, written off in that sense of ever turning out the way I want to turn out. Fine. Okay, I'm, I'm back in New Jersey. And the deal was, uh, you had to go to four meetings a week and they wouldn't feed you. It was okay, go. So, okay, I'll do that. More. And as I went to meetings and began to be drawn into the fellowship and the program, um, I was doing stuff that has to do with surrender. Now, I didn't even know. Somehow our higher power takes away from us the burden of clutching onto results the way we have been accustomed to, you know? We were trying to drink right and get away with it for years. And then we finally just, <clears throat> we stopped clutching it because we're just tired of it. We're just, or I'm clutching, I want to make this marriage work. I want to make these kids behave. And if I just do this, and I do this, and, do this, and finally you just... <laughs> we, the results, we don't clutch the results because it's so evident that we're not going to get the results. That we just kind of... Okay. That combined with simply taking a hand. Remember the, the surrender thing, the obsession with results, transforms into an agreement to live with uh, a relationship where we do footwork. I do footwork instead of obsessed with results. And so another way of imitating the image is that I'm ups I'm the center of the universe working it out by myself the best I can. To be, and then so much pain and frustration that I get demoralized and stop doing it. And then someone reaches out a hand. The program reaches out a hand and says, will you take my hand? I'd like you to walk this way and wake up. Say, well, I'm not so sure if I... What is this out anyway? We're going to do. Will you take my hand? Just give a... Come with me a few steps. Just, you just got to take a chance for a few steps. If we... If I wait until you understand this, we're going to wait forever. <laughs> In fact, there's no way to understand it without being a good sport, trying it out a little bit. Oh, well, since there's absolutely nothing else going on in my life, um, and there's nothing else holds any promise, whatever, uh, we kind of take the hand and walk along with it. So I'm walking along, holding somebody's hand, instead of working things out in private. This is a revolution. This is a totally different approach to life. I'm walking along holding a hand. And as I'm doing that, I'm being drawn into some mutuality, into uh, a mutual sharing of stuff on a level, on a deep enough level, where it's shocking. People are saying these awful things about themselves. It's very embarrassing. They say this stuff out in public. Um, and then we're asked to uh, agree to be a part of the group, and we find we are anyway, whether we agree or not, um, we find ourselves beginning to live like an alcoholic, live like an animal, live according to the truth of our guts, of our inside. And we're, it's like a, a fiat accompli, a, it's done, and we're into it. And that's, that's what I found. I was just, I was going to meetings every single day, twice on Saturday. Um, and I was hanging out with alcoholics, and I was feeling... This deep thing, of course I'm alcoholic. And I felt peaceful about being alcoholic. And so I was in a relationship, a new kind of relationship with a higher power 
and starting to surrender, agree to simply live as a child of God and do this footwork. Now, as I was kind of tricked into doing it, just like as I just said to, I said, okay, I can't think of anything else right now. And as it began to take a little bit, and I began to surrender, there's a remarkable thing about surrender. On the one hand, it seems very unnatural to do it. And on the other hand, the minute we do it, it seems very natural. It seems, well, of course. Of course I'm alcoholic. I mean, you need to tell me you can see that. Um, and we got relaxed with it. Um, of course, sharing on a level of uh, emotional honesty, where you listen to other people take their turn and I take my turn, of course that's a, uh, that's a humane, human, sensible sort of a way to live it. I'm a human being. I'm a social animal. I need to have other people share their guts so I can identify and get reaffirmation that I'm, a, of course, once you're doing it, it's sure, why, of course, it's natural as can be. Uh, any of us want to do that when we're drinking? Go to a meeting and wait 50 minutes for your turn. <laughs> I mean, that's just absurd. Uh, that's why when a person is under the influence, they don't do well in a whole meeting. You know, you see. Um, but, the, but there's levels of surrender. Um, I want to distinguish three levels. The full surrender, all out the nausea level, and the not yet ready level. And the full level is full of paradox, because the minute I fully surrender and just let go, and I'm not, I find myself not fighting anything, half because I lost the energy to fight, and the other half is I begin to identify with people who are not fighting, and they gave you permission. You're not being unpatriotic when you don't fight yourself. And so the combination of the two things I actually relax for a few minutes. And I relax and I'm in harmony and I'm not fighting who I am and what I am. And I find out, oh, this is nice. Surrender, once we're doing it, is invisible. Once we're doing it, you don't feel especially religious or spiritual. You just feel sane. You just feel like you've stopped doing some real dumb things. You just feel like you're not giving yourself an arbitrary, stupid, bad time. Full surrender is the simplest kind of respect for reality, the way it is. It's agreeing to live in the world as it is. But if you don't agree to live in the world as it is, the world stays exactly the same anyway. And the only difference is that I have a tightened gut, and I'm in, in conflict and turmoil. And when I agree to live in the world as it is, anything else other than that, it seems so stupid that I wonder why I ever did it. It takes take the issue of surrendering in a relationship. It doesn't mean letting the other person use you as a doormat. It means being willing to let that other person be who and what they are fully, unconditionally, without any reservation. You give them permission to be the big jerk they are. Or you give them permission to be the beautiful person they are. And it's the same thing. You know, if you can't see they're a beautiful person, then you can't see it. If you know that they're a jerk and a beautiful person, you have a chance. You can uh, just give them permission to have all the hang-ups and all the... Give them permission to be somebody who can't listen, to be somebody who can't catch on to the easiest thing in the world. Uh, <laughs> And uh, once we've done that, we notice at least two things. And we can't do that by ourselves, only with God's help. Only in the program, surrounded by the cloud of witnesses, surrounded by a lot of support, can we let another person truly be. And as soon as you let another person be, even if it's for like ten minutes, there's two things. One is, you will the goodness and beauty God put in that person becomes available to you. They're cute. They got, there's a, 
there's a certain, uh, the beauty and the interest they have is now available because we're not fighting it. And the other is that they don't get on your nerves the same way at all. They just don't drive you nuts. They be, instead of being a jerk who drives you nuts, they become a character. Now, it just about kills you to do this, of course. And you know, we only do it with God's help. But the minute we do it, it is, it's, the, it's like the air here today. The sunshine and clear air flowing by. You say, well, what else will I do? Like not let them be who they are? When you're letting somebody be who they are, it's so manifestly obvious that that's the only sane thing to do that it's impossible to imagine not doing it. Until we have some pressure that makes us take it back five minutes later. Um, is that we, right before we let somebody, we release somebody, it seems like if we do that, they'll go right down the tube without our support of holding them in place. Uh, they'll just fall apart. If I'm not insisting, they don't. Um, and of course, they, and surrendering somebody improves them a lot. Um, they have this big overhaul right before your eyes. Now, when we're surrendering, the deep surrender we experience not as a great feat that we deserve some applause for or credit for. We experience deep surrender for what it really is. A blessing from God. Simple sanity. Nothing more than simple sanity. It's just what anybody would do if they couldn't keep any secrets and all the lights were on. The, uh, all the, the emotional, mental life. Now, the nausea level. The nausea level is that level of surrender where we, you're talking to your sponsor and you're explaining a few reasons why you're miserable and uh, because of the person you're living with who's, uh, uh, is so uh, unreasonable and hostile and full of deceit. Um, and, you <laughs> and your sponsor says, well, you know, uh, you didn't just find this out. Uh, you're, um, and you've been living there a long time. But, uh, you think your own attitude may have some play here. Uh, that you're uh, that you're kind of sitting there, hanging on. You've decided that they don't have any more excuse for certain behavior. That they, they should know it up by now, and you're hanging on to this thing. Thing they ha they should change. They should change, and they won't. And it's just outrageous. It is unjust. Um, and I refuse to be relaxed or happy until they change. Um, and the uh, you think that maybe your own insistence that they be different might be the biggest single factor in your anguish right now. That somebody who is sick and who is on kind of not too loving, they're difficult to be around. Um, but when we add our own lack of surrender in our own funny ways, it just redoubles and triples and quadruples the anguish that results from being around a person like that. And, they, and the response suggests that maybe when you let that person go entirely, it, it won't make life this perfect, but it will take away probably three quarters of all the anguish you have. And, the, and if, if you begin to believe just a little bit of that, you get sick to your stomach immediately. You get... You, there's a nausea, you know. This thing of... That somehow the little flashes of fear come in that it's like your fault and they're going to make fun of you. And then you're going to have to let something be. And you're afraid if you let those muscles relax that, uh, that you just might disappear or fall apart or you won't know who you are. Or, um, it makes you sick to your stomach, sick of fear and, and self loathing and, and embarrassment. And, uh, oh God. And they, and you could have done this years ago. You could just do this by yourself. You don't need the other person's cooperation. You've been waiting for them to do something for years. 
and now you're finding out that you can do something without waiting for them. That's the key deal, you know. It is so embarrassing that you're sick to your stomach. Um, and the and then as soon as you make the move and start letting go, the nausea passes. We even feel disloyal at that point, especially with kids. If you surrender your children, well, you just feel like you're an irresponsible parent if you don't insist they be turn out right. Um, and of course, when we retire from being God, we we'll play God and we'll let God be God in ourselves. You know, your obligation is to, if you do have children is to be a mother and not God. Uh, uh, so as we as we begin to make the move. The nausea does begin to pass. It's, um, we start getting over it, and then it, when we're in the surrender, again, it's like clear air. And it's as if, oh, of course I do this. Why would I do anything different? Once we're in surrender, it just seems impossible not to do it. Um, then there's a not ready yet level. And that has to do with the, those issues in our life where we're bedeviled still by some behavior or some feeling. That uh, we are, we have conflict about them. They're, they're bother us. Uh, we can't decide whether it's so bad or wrong, but it bothers us. Um, anybody have any obsessive habits that uh, uh, you know? Um, anyone uh, have a problem with procrastination? No. This kind of goes, I touched on this last night with uh, the thing of accepting ourselves as procrastinators, you know, who would do one thing in front of us. An adulterer who committed adultery or don't commit adultery today and give thanks that you don't have to be in anguish. Um, but the, let's say procrastination. Procrastination is deferring things. You know, I think the root of it is fear sort of a perfectionism, but I don't want to do it until I'm pretty sure I'll do it well enough not to be humiliated and made fun of. And that while I'm considering how to do it right, four more things come in to do, and uh, which now makes me have five things to do. It's much more difficult to do five things in one and to do it well enough for my own standards. And so this is a bigger problem, so I must contemplate more deeply um, how to do five. And there are by the time I start making the first move, there are nine more things. And then mail came, and I'm in despair. Um, and so they, we want to get over this, you know? And so you've got to struggle around with it and pray and turn it over and so forth. And still there's a certain pattern in your life uh, of procrastination and the, the kind of anguish and uh, pressure that goes along with that. And, and so you've worked surrender. You've done the surrender prayer. You've done this and that. And you're still opening your mail by opening this. Well, I'm going to have to do something about that. Now, what's the next thing? Advertisement. Well, I know I probably don't want it, but I wonder. So I read a little bit about it. And I might want this later. I don't know. And uh, and there's a little bill here. Uh, well, I'll have to pay it today. I, um, and if you've opened up all the mail, and haven't made one decision. Uh, uh, and the, anyway, I don't want to go out too long, but the point is, how does surrender come in this thing? If you're in the middle of something, an obsessive compulsive habit of uh, eating chocolate at night or having multiple affairs or, uh, or not making decisions when you know about the mail. Um, and it's bugs you. It's on your mind a lot about the mess in your in your desk or your kitchen. Um, and um, so, does surrender have anything? Now, you might think, well, yeah, just turn it over to God and do your footwork and get it done, and you'll be all right. Right? Uh, what about when you? Turn it over to God, and you keep behaving the same way. 
and then you think, well, that just that doesn't. I don't know. This doesn't work with surrender. I'll just put this over in another compartment and go on. Uh, uh, and we have tried to surrender it, and we've got it in the surrender prayer, and we've done some things like that, and it still hasn't changed very much. Then there's some resistance and holding on to something that's down deep enough below the surface, but we don't have access. We now. So the surrender question is, are you willing to be a person with an obsessive compulsive habit that you don't have access to the roots of, you don't understand? Are you willing to be that? Are you willing to get up today and live your life with a willingness to be enlightened, but knowing you're not enlightened yet, and you're hanging on to some old ideas and fear in regard to this thing? Are you willing to show up and know that you're not making much progress on this but you're willing to be it. You're willing to be a person with a sex problem, with a fear problem, with a money problem, with a stealing from the store problem. Uh, you're willing to be that. You can't fake it. You have to be really willing to have a problem you can't solve in your terms right away. But you're willing to keep on the table and not make a complete secret of. Tell somebody about and to be willing to do some footwork and willing to have the footwork not pay off in the terms you'd like it to pay off, which is make it go away. Or make the guilt go away so I can enjoy myself more. Um, or something. You know, to, uh, <laughs> to get the uh, tension down so I feel better. Results. And the surrender says, no, you don't get to pick your results. We want you to show up before your higher power with your real life as it is, turn yourself in, and be willing to do footwork, and trust God to show his love and care for you while you are unfinished. While you are voluntarily or involuntarily hanging on to some thing where you don't even understand yourself. That's the not ready yet surrender. And you say, well, Father, are you just kind of making an elaborate rationalization so we can keep, so you can keep doing, or we can keep doing whatever the hell you want to do? I hope not. <laughs> no. I think we can misuse anything. You know. But I taught, I know myself, and I've talked to many, many, many people. And I see people, you know, kicking themselves around and you know, kind of endorsing surrender, but just figuring, well, it doesn't work for me, and I can't do that, and I do that. Um, I see a lack of a willingness to live in the presence of God with an unsolved problem. And to work our surrender means to be willing to live with an unsolved problem. And not insist we get it all together every in two minutes. Or in two years. Or in ten years. Uh and to keep showing up at the place where it works, you know. Uh, to be willing to... Anyway. Um, back to that notion of results. Uh, I find that I have to uh, think about this in an explicit way to work any kind of surrender in my life all the time. This is something that... You know, we say a surrender prayer, and I like to end the session with a surrender, a surrender prayer or the transition to a meeting. Um, but that surrender prayer gets us to have surrender as our life policy. But the fifth, so it's real. You say the surrender prayer and mean it with God's help. It changes the way you live and the way you are. But it doesn't get your our whole selves into surrender every minute. It's obvious because we have a lot of conflict still. Uh, that's our life policy. So it bothers us more when we don't surrender, after we surrender, than it did before we surrendered, because we didn't know what surrender was. Um, but every time we do anything, every time we do anything, all the way from saying, good morning, that's doing something, up to starting a law course, uh, up to uh, starting a new career, up to starting a new relationship, every time we embark on the simplest little thing or the most demanding long-term thing, 
we have a result in mind, and it's not bad to have a result in mind. It's absolutely inevitable to have a result in mind, because we wouldn't get geared up to do anything unless we had a result in mind. And it's fine. It's just that as we start, every time we start anything, and there's a result in mind, as we do it, we have the habit of saying, higher power, you know what I want. I know what I want. I'd like this to work, but I will be done, and I'm willing for it not to. To give the result away, if we think of it that explicitly. And if we, sometimes we can get into a habit of doing it rather easily, um, and that just brings all kinds of peace, all kinds of maturity into our life. Uh, it, but we still have the result. We hope it works, and we'll, we'll shift a little bit, and hope it comes close, you know. And if it doesn't, then we reorganize and, and do something different and do it over again. Um, Take it to be very simple. Like, as soon as we turn over that result, then we're, you know, we have some security and, and we don't go crazy. We're not vulnerable to other people's behavior so much. If I say good morning, I have a result in mind. I'd like you to look back at me and say good morning back. Uh... Now, if I surrender the result and be, and I, I'm fundamentally willing for you not to say good morning back, it'll still kind of hurt my feelings if you don't. But it's, it'll hurt my feelings, but if I'm surrendered, after my feelings are hurt, my reaction to her will be, I wonder what's wrong with her. She must be kind of distracted or out of it today to not notice. I'll say a prayer for her. If I've not surrendered, I'll say, you're not going to catch me saying good morning to you, you. Um, you know, you took something away from me. I gave, you didn't. You know, da -da -da -da. I'll have hostility and I'll be upset. It's all a matter of that, that totally different approaches. You know. As we start out in a relationship, if we want this relationship to work, fine. That's human. Everybody wants a relationship to work and be nice and turn out. If we insist that it turns out, it's like walking up to somebody and putting your hand on their elbow and squeezing and saying, honey, it's up to you now to make me happy. And I'm not letting go until you do. <laughs> or if we are willing if we grab the other person total freedom and so forth, it kills you too, you know. If we want it to work so much, but we are willing, God, please let me have the willingness to let this person do whatever they're going to do and be whoever they want to be and let them go. Uh, and then, hello. <laughs> the little conversation. And then we can, uh, we're much better met. We don't scare people nearly as much when we've surrendered them. The same way you notice yourself, when you meet somebody who has not assigned you the role of making them happy, you can breathe easy. And as soon as you detect any assignment, um, that it's up to you now to make them happy, uh, it's hard going. And you're not living in the world of surrender. Uh, so it's, a, it's just a blessing. We, we often think of surrender in terms of doing something that's difficult and that's a big deal. And boy, oh, I'm going to surrender and turn it over and give it away and let God's way be first and mine second. And, and like we're really giving up a lot, you know? We're giving up grief <laughs> and insanity and a grinding gut. Uh, see, it's really heroic, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> Uh, but so often it's it's impossible to do by ourselves. I think one of the 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 aspects of surrender that I find very maybe the worst, hardest myself, and I think it's very much human nature, is to uh, is to agree to have all of your hang-ups and not push them. Let your your fears and your phobias and your hang-ups and everything be just as they are. And ask God to help you 
do the next thing that's sensible for a person in your shape. And trust God to love you and show care for you while you're in the shape you're in. Uh, that, that, to me, is the most difficult thing in the world. There's a feeling that first I got to get over this and that, and then I'll be positioned well for for moving ahead. But I'm not positioned well. Enough. Wait a minute, God. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let's take this. Uh, my sponsor said that the that the unforgivable sin is to avoid God until you're in good enough shape to fool him. Uh, yeah. Somehow. Not bring it up to God until you're in better shape. You know? And uh, a lot of times, you know, with the awareness, the ACA thing, you know, we become aware of um, of how we get our reaction to a sick family has has resulted in our being wired in a way, you know, kind of, of the readiness to do real stupid things, to kind of get very attracted to sick people, uh, to to go into uh, deep feelings of anxiety and guilt when other people are having problems, you know, take emotional responsibility for other people's problems, and lie low. And we think, I gotta get over that. And surrender says, let's walk along the path of healing in the program. Let's be willing to have your history and your wiring and the way you are, and trust God as you do the steps to take care of you with your wiring. It's not tragic. You're gonna do all right. You don't have to wait until you're over something. Before you're allowed, before you're allowed to breathe and live, um, you do footwork, but we do it in a calm spirit. We do it in a step-by-step way. Um, I'm a little late, but you were a little late too. Um, the, uh, so let's pray the surrender prayer together now, um, and then I'd like you to be patient. Wait a minute. Let's and and, and count off again, okay? And we'll do the, what do we do first? Um, let's pray the prayer first. And then be good sports and stay where you can be counted for about one minute. Now let's uh, get myself here. Some of you know this by heart. Some of you don't. If you don't know it by heart, just say amen at the end. God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and to do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties so that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. May I do thy will always. Amen. Okay. Eight. This is the end of session three, the start of session four. There is a six-word, three-sentence summary of the program that you're all familiar with, I'm sure. Trust God, clean house, help others. And the the middle part of that, clean house, is what I'd like to reflect on here. The middle steps of the program, taking inventory, uh, sharing the inventory, the humility steps of six and seven, where we agree Mm -hmm. to let God work on us. Uh, and beg him to, <laughs> and the amen steps. These um, these steps are kind of under the heading, cleaning house, telling the truth. And I um, that I, I use the word clean house, the phrase, because it gives me the creeps so much. Uh, I just hear clean house, and there's a chill up my spine, and um, oh God, clean house. Uh, got to confess and get my sins straight. And you know what that means. Once you confess, and there's going to be a firm purpose of amendment. This is Catholic language. Um, and that means you can't do them again. And there's, there's, two, two poss- there's two results of not being able to do your sins again. One is that you really will not do them again and never have any fun for the rest of your life. <laughs> or you will do them again and feel like a failure and guilty and so forth. So it's if you're reflecting on this whole issue 
in a spirit of fear, it's very discouraging. And of course, that's, I've been talking about transformation. Transformation of attitude, transformation of spirit, transformation of the way we live, that it isn't a matter of uh, finally getting enough strength to do what we always needed had to be done. It's a matter of being led by our higher power to do it in another way. And I think this issue of telling the truth is the is right at the maybe the, like the, the most stark uh, instance of something changing in the middle. You know, the very nature of it changes as we come towards the program. You know, the fourth step comes after the first three. And the uh, first three, without the first three steps, it really would be stupid to take an inventory. Because all we would do is take it in our, in our old attitude. We just write out a bunch of things we feel guilty about and feel bad, and feel worse. Um, an inventory is only safe and only makes sense when we've taken the first three steps or in the middle of them, you know, when, we, when we're drawn into them and, and have that spirit. The, um, uh, and think of it this way, we, we're, trans, we're transformed from fear to faith. We're not transformed from being fearful people into being people full of faith with no fear anymore. A basic principle is that we never get over anything. We never get rid of anything entirely. Well, you can say you get rid of drinking entirely if you stay sober a day at a time. But we don't get rid of alcoholism at all. We don't get rid of our being fearful in many ways. What we do is add the program. We add the experience of being accepted with respect and love. and uh, We add this faith thing. And as we add that, we get to live more and more in the spirit of faith, while our fears are around. The more faith we have, the more program we have, the more the fears get scrunched up to the side and don't have much of an effect. They'll rush right back to center stage the minute they have room to move in. Um, but there, there they are. Now, the experience we have, and I, I think all of us share this right here, uh, you know, we lived a life where where you lied. I lied a lot. I lied in a very systematic, never-let-up way when I drank. I didn't think of myself as lying very much. I thought I was a pretty good guy. I didn't even think I was lying unless I told a big, fat lie. You know, the big, fat one where you just lie. <laughs> Tell them something different. But if it's anything short of that, um, I didn't count it as, you know, it's like exercising your right to privacy, kind of thing. Um, but to give some notion of of how consistent uh, my lying was, I kind of did a little role playing in my imagination of what it would have been like had I ever told the truth while drinking. Now I never did. But if I ever had told the truth while I was drinking, it would have gone something like this. I would have gone over, let's say you invited me over to the house for Saturday night social get-together. And I knew you well enough to know there'd be booze there. And if I was assured there'd be booze there and I didn't have a better offer, I'd say, sure, I'll be over. And, uh, and if I were going to tell the truth, which I never did, I would have arrived at your house, knocked on the door, you'd answer the door, and say, hi, thanks for asking me over. Um, I'd like to lay my cards on the table and get a few things straight before we start out this evening. Um, I'm here to drink. Uh, and, uh, I'd like a double scotch right now. Before we go on anymore with any talk. Now. Okay. When I get my drink, I say, look, you were nice enough to ask me over. I'm going to be a good sport. You got games to play? I'll play the games. Other people coming over? I'll mix it up. I'm trying to get a lot. Usually this kind of an evening, I get a little bit gassed, but I do all right generally. However, it's only fair to warn you, sometimes I go crazy. 
and uh, I might throw up on the rug, get in a fight, try to seduce somebody. But that's the chance you take when you ask me over. And, uh, you didn't tell the truth either, did you? See, when I'm living as an alcohol, drinking alcoholic, or with the whole attitude, the whole fear way of life, it is to my interest that you not know a lot about what I'm up to and what I feel and what's going on, because it interferes with the whole project if you know too much, uh, if you know hardly anything. Uh, I never tell. And that's the way of life. And the whole people-pleasing thing, the whole screening off that I try to control your reactions by just feeding you the stuff I want you to hear. Uh, they're just so deadening, you know. Just boring, dullsville. Uh, life when we just tell each other the good stuff. And what we're waiting for is the real good stuff. Um, you know, with some honesty about what's happening. The, um, so we come, we, and we're accustomed to this. You know, we live for years with this practice thing of hiding our weaknesses, hiding what could be embarrassing, hiding anything that could be used by the enemy uh, to make it harder to get a drink or make it harder uh, or, or, or find us being despised. Um, that fear. Um, we come, you know, okay, fast forward into <laughs> crashing and burning and the frustration of being a co in a family with just being obsessed with uh, trying to help out and try to change things. Um, and, and it just is severe for someone who is uh, in the family disease is not drinking because almost all of the all of the, the energy in trying to change the behavior of somebody else when the focus is on changing behavior good tactics always dictate that you parcel out the information very judiciously you don't let them know certain things you let them know other things it's always manipulative when we have our focus on the behavior change. And you never let them know what you're really up to. It's always some kind of a little angle. Uh, and it gets them mad all the time. And there's reactive stuff. The, and so we come to the program with years of habit of this. And as you come in the program, come in a meeting, you hear people actually volunteering things that put them at a disadvantage in your where you usually live, you know. I remember going to my 12-step house in New Jersey, and there was a skinny priest named Father Mike, uh, Mad Mike, we called him. And he, uh, we just been to a meeting, I've been to about one or two meetings, and he said, boy, I have ever, do I have a resentment against that secretary of the Wednesday night uh, Morris Plains meeting? I can't, he, I can't stand him. But well, I'll, Oh, i got to turn it over. I'll turn them over and say a prayer. I had never heard an adult talk like that in my life. I had never heard a grown-up person acknowledge that they did something wrong and say they were going to try to correct it with God's help. I had never heard... I heard confessions, but I never heard anybody just say it in conversation. Priest or non-priest or man or woman. I, it was shocked. And I heard, and, I, and then of course the reaction to him was, oh yeah, Mike, he's, he's, you know, he's a tough guy to get along with. Her. There was acceptance. And then you hear more and more of the stuff until all the rules are changed. See, it's turned upside down from being having to hide stuff so that we won't be rejected and criticized and given a bad time and make it harder to get a drink. We get into this thing where uh, the weight of our own secrets and the heaviness of all of this um, uh, isolation and uh, we're just not connecting, you know? We're, we're not identifying enough to, to have any solace given to our hearts and we're, we're alone and there's no, there's no real comfort because it's, uh, we don't get comfort by somebody saying, oh, poor thing, poor baby. It doesn't give comfort. <laughs> what gives comfort is someone else to tell you what they've done 
And then when you say what, how you feel and what you've done, they'll say, yeah, I know what you mean. That, that you get comfort then. Uh, and so we start getting this thing where we say what's in our heart, and instead of anybody using that to their advantage, they receive it matter-of-factly, and we identify. And when that happens, the tra- that's a transformation right there. You know, on the spot. But then, when it happens, there's further transformation. There's a transformation down deeper that we, because we identify and connect up with somebody and we don't feel alone anymore, well, then it, we don't feel so bad. And we know we're, this is part of being a human being. And we don't, maybe we don't get over what we've just discussed and don't solve the problem on the spot. Um, I know with uh, my own background, I would hesitate to say things because I thought if I, once I said it, I had to have a way to solve it. Completely. And I'd be skeptical about being able to solve it. Never have another drink again. Uh, never have a dirty thought again. <laughs> never have um, you know, the failure of courage and uh, of perfectionism and uh, I'm just being a procrastinator and avoidance person. That I I don't want to talk about that stuff because I don't think I'm I don't think I have it together enough to be better. I always wanted to work it out before saying something. You know? And uh we don't get to work we work it out by saying something. And we say it and almost always as we share what we have to share, there's a funny kind of transformation. Before, we're obsessed with results. We're obsessed with observable change. Where we're not, where we're more efficient or more courageous or got it together, more charming, pretty or something. And uh, instead of the observable results being different, it's just a, a greater solidarity with other people that just gives us solace to the heart. Uh, and it's, and we don't even change sometimes. We on the spot. We don't change the way we thought we'd change. You know? We kind of keep some hang up or um, you, you confess your hang up. You have a fear. You can't stand to go to the podium and finally say, well, "I'll do anything. I won't go to that meeting because they have a podium, and I won't do this because I might have to stand up and say something." You say, ah, I got it off my chest. I was honest. You still feel that way. Um, but you may be able to do it and be nervous and be afraid of it and find out you lived. Uh, and then never... My, I have a little sister who's sober longer than I am in fellowship. And uh, she'll be 20 years sober next July. My little sister. Um, and she... Um, she's afraid of the podium. She... With her brother being this maniac talker, she told a short version of her story for the first time, the nine-minute version when she took her sixth birthday cake. Uh, and she's honest about that thing, but she's got this thing still sort of inhibition. Um, so that the way it goes. And the um, to, again, just to sketch out this picture of the transformation still. Um, you know, I want to, you know, I guess underline it's not just a matter of confessing, of finally telling them. It's sharing in the atmosphere of our fellowship and program. That's what's healing. Uh, and, uh, and again, the, the, they say, well, that'd be, yeah, it's nice. Confession's good for the soul, and, you know, be honest. I, that's kind of nice. Well, it's not just kind of nice, it's life saving. You see, when we're living in our disease, we're in pain. And we're in pain. There's two levels of pain two that I distinguish. The deep level and the surface level. On the surface level is not trivial pain. Serious stuff on the surface. Broken bones, divorces, public humiliation, death of loved ones, fatal diseases, 
on and on. That you say, you call it the surface? Yeah, it's pain that you know where it's coming from, and it's awful. Um, but there it is. Then there's pain that's kind of dull and deep, and I call that the oceanic ache. That's the pain that goes along with this illness. It's a pain that's caused by the inability to be honest. The inability to be honest in an atmosphere of acceptance and trust. The inability to speak our heart so that we can be healed, so that we can be comforted. And every human being has a deep need to say what's inside and have someone else hear it and look back at us. We need to have that done. We yearn to have that done. If we don't get to do that, we are in isolation. We're in anguish. Because there's no, there's no connection and there's no felt understanding and love. We cannot believe we're loved. If the one who supposedly loves us doesn't know our story, we just they, they just love an image, you know. They they wouldn't they wouldn't love me if they knew. No way. That's by the way the um, the core belief of the addict. You read about the sexual compulsive behavior in uh, Out of the Shadows, a book by Patrick, Patrick Carnes, and he talks about the core beliefs of an addict that the Inside and it works for. Yeah, they're pretty loud outside too. Um, the like the core beliefs. He said there's four core beliefs and only one of the beliefs has to do with a particular addiction. The first is basically I'm no good. Second, if they knew the truth, they'd reject me. They'd never accept. Third, if I have to wait around. For, their, for them to help me fulfill my needs, I'd wait forever. i got to take care of things myself. Fourth, control is my most important need. Sex is my most important need. Being sexually attractive as the co is my most important need. A drink is my most important need. A pill is. That will take care, that will give solace. We need solace. We need love. We need to be connected as children of God with one another. We just yearn for that. God, I have it. And when it's blocked off, we are, we're at a, a, an ache. I call the oceanic ache. It's that dull pain. And that's the kind of pain that puts us in jeopardy of drinking again, of, of acting again. With that pain, you add one of those surface pains of the death of a spouse, the a real setback, you lose your job. And if it's combined with the oceanic ache, we're gone. We'll do something. We'll do something crazy. Uh, and when we get in the program, that oceanic ache begins to drain away. We still have all the troubles of life. But it begins to drain away so that once we're really working our surrender and self-acceptance and and a faith leads us to start telling the truth in this kind of way that the middle steps lead us to do, and that ache begins to drain away, then all of those surface pains in life change the way they affect us. And, we, and we've experienced this already. If somebody dies and you have the oceanic ache, you have a drink because, God, they died. Once we're in the program and that drains away, if somebody dies you love, you know, I've got enough grief and trouble without drinking besides. It's, it, it sharpens the motivation to be sober. It increases our gratitude. And all down the line, I lost, lose your job? Well, I lost my job. I don't have much money. And it's secure. I'm sure I'm not going to drink besides that and make it worse. You know. So everything is turned. You see? Once that our heart is, has the solace it needs. Um, and it is working the middle steps that does that. Working the middle steps that connects us up with God and other human beings so that we have this flow. The flow of recognition, love, understanding, acceptance. And once that's flowing, 
and going on, we become very tough. You know, we're fragile in our own way. But we, once that's going on, nobody can take it away from you. Nobody can get you drunk, and nobody can get you to panic and live in control again. They just can't. Because the more pressure brought to bear, once the program's in place, the more motivation to work the program. It just locks in. So we, uh, we begin to do this stuff, you know. Uh, it occurred to me the other day, again, I love paradox, as you probably are noticing. Um, someone was extolling honesty. I think I might have mentioned this in the opening night here. But I, uh, you know, when we actually practice honesty, it doesn't, feel, it's not a smooth deal, you know. Uh, we still have our fear affecting us. And, uh, we're not so sure about this. Um, and there's a certain amount, there's a certain despair and sense of failure. Even the sense of death in being honest. Because as we get honest, the old self dies. The old image bites the dust. You can't keep up the old front when you're talking against the old front. You know, start, uh, uh, oh my God. But it makes us feel disoriented, you know. Uh, what'll I do with my, I get, get the new image, you know. And as we, uh, try it out and tell the truth. Of course, we um, we so the instant it, the connection's made, well, then the anguish is over about losing our image and that kind of thing. The thing about the the way the you know, the fourth and fifth step is constructed, um, it'll sound when we still <clears throat> have some fear affecting the way we read and understand, and we read the made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Admitted to God, ourselves, and another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. If you hear it in that tone of voice, it seems like this is going to be kind of a guilty kind of trip here. And it see, and there's a, there's a kind of the vibrations of blame going on there. We're going to have to write down everything that's our fault. What's your fault? What do you deserve blame for? And if you start doing an inventory with the attitude that I've got to write down the things I deserve blame for, and sometimes it'll stop you in your tracks. It's very depressing to write down things you deserve blame for. And then you could, because we're, when, it, when we're in fear, that's a fear word, blame. And when we're in fear, we do one of two things with stuff that could be in our inventory. We either justify ourselves, make a case, make a little defense attorney before God. Well, it wasn't really so bad. I mean, if you had a, if your parents were like my parents, you probably would have done it worse. Uh, it is a free country. I mean, it's not against the law, after all. Free consenting adults. Um, <laughs> this, uh, We'll make a case, okay. And then if we're not making a case for ourselves when we're in fear, we will go over to the other side and and just have utter contempt for ourselves. Just say, you low life, you are just disgusting. I mean, not only are you immoral, you're immoral in bad taste. Um, there is no... Uh, no hope for you. Yeah. And you know, you know, you go into a self-disgust thing. That ad- all of that stuff is the way is an attitude of fear. And when we take the, when we start doing our inventory and writing down resentment, we're not. When we write down a resentment, we're not writing down stuff we deserve blame for. There's no one around blaming us. We write down stuff 
that we need healing for, that we need liberation about. We write down stuff where it hurts, where we have hurt them and we have hurt ourselves by hurting, and where we need some healing. Nobody's after us. And we have a higher power who loves us and treasures us. And when we have contempt for ourselves, that interferes with our relationship with God because it's not in harmony with our higher power's attitude. Higher power has compassion and acceptance in the same way any decent member of the fellowship has when you're talking to him. If you're pouring out what's inside of you, you don't have to be the world champion Avalon or AA member. All they have to be is just a regular attending the meetings person. You know? And uh, with full of their own fears and freak out feelings and so forth. And uh, if you start telling them what's on your mind, they're vastly relieved. You're not as good as they thought. Because <laughs> now they're probably going to be able to be honest with you. Um, they receive you with, there's no, you did what? You know, this, uh, well, you know, has anyone ever in a participation meeting, someone got up and talked about uh, abandoning their family in the Midwest and fleeing out here? Say, well, you know, there's consequences of that. I'm afraid we'll have to whip you. <laughs> you know, have to, uh, every member of the group gets five lashes to pay, to pay the price. You know, that's not our business. That's not, it's, on the other hand, the group doesn't pat somebody on the head and say, oh, poor baby, they probably were too demanding on you anyway. Uh, you can. No, there's a, there's a respect for a person. It looks like he got some, some amends to make and some healing to, to go through, and we're going to stand by you while you do what's got to be done for healing. And once, you see, if that attitude there's no reason to be defensive and make excuses. And there's no reason to despise yourself. Either one. Fear is the whole foundation of excuses and self-contempt. And when, once we get into the spirit of the program, it's putting down what we, what we have to say because we need healing there. And when we, what we take responsibility, you know, when it's, uh, uh, when somebody hurt us, you know, the big book says, we don't dwell on the other person's uh, inventory, what they've done wrong. If people have done wrong to you, there's never any reason to pretend they didn't. My original plan this morning was to share, uh, have a reflection on the 11th step, which I'm still going to do, and then lead into a meditation that would be a silent meditation, basically, where everybody would go out in the sunshine and... Uh, <laughs> walk around, uh, and so I think we're a little bit cooped up here, so we'll probably have a guided meditation for a little while right where we're sitting. It's pretty high. Uh, okay. Oh yeah, I got, we'll have to get a microphone here next year or something. Um, Okay, the eleventh step, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understand Him, praying only for knowledge of His will for us and the power to carry that out. Um, this is the, the this is the step where we cooperate with our higher power to energize, let grow the spiritual awakening he's bringing about within us. The thing about prayer is not that we need to remind God of anything or kind of get him on our side or give him instructions or uh, show how good we are. It's nothing to... It, you know, and this is not some, like, you know, some modern reflection as if I am saying, dun, 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 the 20th century, we know now uh, that we... We're not the one that cajole God into doing things. Uh, this is standard spiritual wisdom. Uh, St. Augustine in the 5th 
century had long essays on how our prayers aren't meant to change God at all. Our prayers simply change us so that our hearts are more open to the action. Um, the God's favor, God's love, his, his way is on. His love is out there. Healing and forgiveness, and uh, that's flowing like a river. That's going on. The, the only variable in the whole thing is, is what's inside of us. The only variable is um, how whether I can catch it or not. Uh, and if I'm drinking and distracted, uh, I'm and what I was just calling it, uh, the, when I have a lot of I gotas, I gotta have this, I gotta have this. Gotta, um, when I got the gotas, I am single-mindedly paying attention to what I what I figure. I need in the way and when I need it, and I simply miss what my higher power has in mind. It just kind of sails by. Could have got it, but I'm not paying attention to that. But I got my hands full. Um, and in our desperation for for survival, we kind of do that. Um, and after we begin to have a spiritual awakening and we're drawn into the fellowship, and we kind of get wised up a bit, and we give our hearts healed a bit, and we have some people who start to know us as we are, and we start to have some exchange, and it's this wonderful relief, where you don't have to put up a, or any pretense, we put it up anyway, just, just in case, uh, but we can devote less energy to the pretense, um, and we uh, start letting the spiritual touch, the awakening have a big effect in our life and guide us, well, even then, we're in a world with a lot of com competing voices. Uh, you know, I started out the retreat by talking about how recovery itself can take the shine off of our spiritual awakening by distracting us into the, all of the advance and the job we're doing and comparing how well I'm doing. Um, and it goes on and on. Uh, there is the risk of um, making this tape unable to be sent through the mail. Um, <laughs> I think that it's just, you know, like for educational purposes only. I have to use this this word in order to get across the kind of distraction which I think is of the biggest obstacles to letting our spiritual awakening continue to nourish and guide us. Um, it is. The way this is described is unforgettable to me. The guy, I go to a, my home, main home meeting is the White Flag in Sack, downtown Los Angeles. One of the guys came in one night and he was, he was saying, oh, I've been listening to K-Fuck all day. Um, <laughs> And uh, I'm sorry if that I, that's what he said, and it everybody knew what he meant. You know? Everybody knew that there's that there's a running commentary of self-obsessed fear in the back of our heads. Just this running commentary on how bad everyone else is doing, and how unfair life is, and how things are going wrong. She's leaving. Um, it's, uh, <laughs> and the there is great competition for computer time, you might call it. The great competition: who gets on the screen? There's lots of people waiting in line to get on your screen. Uh, Self-obsessed fear, regular talk radio. Uh, the kids, all kind of competing influences and so forth, and they all want their waiting their turn to get on the screen. Maybe two or three at once are on the screen, so you're kind of looking uh, like this. And um, prayer has to do with deliberately tuning in to your own spiritual awakening. 
tuning in to your higher power and the basis of our own experience of a higher power so that we're not swept away by listening to that radio station where it just fills our life with negativity uh, and, and a thing that drains us instead of nourishes us. And as we, well, how do you do that? How do you tune in? Well, we, you know, I, we start to meditate. We listen to God. Well, how do you listen to God? I want to suggest that everybody here has a lot of experience and we're fairly practiced at listening to God. Uh, anybody who's been to meetings on any kind of a regular basis has gotten used to a certain uh, spiritual discipline, a routine. And I call it kind of an active meditation. And when we do that, we, we simply at a meeting and somebody starts to share their experience, strength, and hope. And as they're telling their story or going through what they're going to go through, um, and it's, you know, at a, at a significant percentage of the time, somebody who is sharing their experience, strength, and hope is doing so in a way that we can relate to. And they're doing so in a way where they, they talk about their life and what happened in terms of the spiritual awakening they had. Now, they, they may not mention the word God, and they may not mention the word spiritual awakening at all. Probably won't. Uh, but they'll simply tell their story. And in the story, if there's a turn in their life where it was from struggling and being negative and despair and total frustration into finding a big relief where they were drawn into this pathway where instead of try and try and try and fight yourself, there was a, a turn and a peacefulness where we just kind of relax and someone holds your hand while you get used to being a think bad algae. And then they give you some suggestions on footwork that makes you more peaceful with that um, and then give you suggestions that uh, increase the quality of our spiritual hygiene. You know, instead of constantly hiding, we actually can connect with another person. Instead of being so drained and, and taken up with our self-obsession, we're drawn out of ourselves and pay attention to somebody else, and then find the relief and the, the freshening up and the relaxation that comes from being let off the hook where I can actually pay attention to another human being. Uh, and instead, all those things that start to happen, and then the uh, the discovery that we're we're sober and we don't mind it. I'm sober and I don't feel like I'm doing some big heroic thing. I feel like I'm just fortunate that I get that I get to be clean and sober. I don't have to go through all that exhausting, draining, isolating. Ah. Uh, Oh, thank you, God. That's a spiritual awakening, by the way. If you don't even think of God directly, but rather indirectly. And if you're listening to somebody's pitch, and be it A.A. or Alan on it, somebody starts talking about the, the surprising liberation, doing it, do a little workout of release with love. Hey, I release you. I heard one, uh, Alan on only one time. And it was suggested to her that she give her husband permission to drink. And it was meant, you know, inside, let go, don't resist the thing. But she walked in and says, I give you permission to drink. You know? uh, and he said, you know, uh, but, uh, but it was part of her spiritual awakening. She did it. It confused him to no end. He didn't know what was going on for a while. Uh, but when we listen to these, to the stories of our brothers and sisters, and in the middle of the story you say, oh yeah, uh-huh, yeah, you're meditating. You're listening to God. Now wait a minute, that person is God there. That's what I mean. When we identify with the spiritual awakening of another, with someone else's spiritual awakening, and I listen to it, and it rings my bell. If it resonates with the experience I've had, then the experience I've had comes to life. It's, it's raised up on my screen. It has the, the center. 
And as, when it's raised up on my screen, it becomes a more vital thing within me. And then, then I relate that past event to today. And it has an effect of giving more hope for today and more encouragement to live in the spirit of that past experience. In other words, I'm listening to God. I'm listening to the voice of God that hit me already and that then speaks to me afresh about today and I get encouragement and direction. See, you're all good at it already. You're all good at meditation. And when we meditate, we do something like that all the time. We, you use a 24-hour-a-day book, you use uh, another book, uh, and uh, what you're doing is reading something that's a reflection or a report or a reflection on or the result of a spiritual experience of somebody. And if you uh, read the report of someone else's spiritual experience, and if it rings your bell, if you identify it all, there's that, that thing happens. And as the thing happens, you know, it becomes available to me, and that process goes on, and we listen to God. We can do that in a meeting. We can do that out of a little book. We can do that. Uh, there are many forms of doing it. One of the, um, a form of meditation that we usually associate with Eastern religion, Buddhism, uh, more of a transcendental meditation, is emptying out. Um, by the way, that form of meditation was much more, was very common among Christians before the printing press. Since the printing press, we got so much paper. We're reading all the time. And we won't shut up. We, we, if we shut up, we'll read. We won't just quiet down and just be in the presence of our higher power uh, with less activity. And so it's that, that tradition was kind of lost, uh, at least it was thinned out. You know? um, and I think there are some mantras. I, I use this a couple of, I consider them more al mantras. Uh, they seem to have the best ones. Uh, so many. Was, but release Release with love or release. Uh, let go. These are my two favorite ones. And all by themselves, they wouldn't mean anything to somebody, you know? Release or let go. But if you've been in the program for a while, then we've had 10,000 hours of conversation and reflection <laughs> on the whole way of life that involves releasing and letting go. Um, to simply say in a meditation, with no book or anything else, just to, to sit there and say, release. And then when your own, when your radio station is coming in, just say, release. Release. What you're saying is, I want to be quiet in the presence of my higher power. Release. I want to be present in the, in the presence of the spiritual awakening my higher power has been giving me. That isn't, I don't have access to it all the time, a lot. And I'm so full of today's stuff and, and my own fears and, and all of this that I, I need my higher power to kind of barge into me and I, I want to cooperate with this empty, giving a little landing space. You know, just quiet down and give a landing space. And it takes a lot of trust to do that. It means you believe in God if you do that. Because if it doesn't make any sense to make an empty space, there's nothing to come in. Um, It's release, or let go. Or you make up your own one, you know, something that suggests the whole program to you, or suggests some special understanding you have, uh, and just be quiet. But this, you know, if we don't have time, if we don't take time to, to just give our spiritual awakening a chance to come up on the screen, well, you know what happens to people who don't go to meetings and don't pray? They get very preoccupied uh, with things. And it's a matter, and if, and if we think of this in terms of fear, the, the usual way we think in terms of things, of being a little bad girl or a good girl, that's fear. Of being a good girl who prays and meditates, very good. 
are bad. Never doing that. And then so you get a little star if you pray, and you get a black mark if you don't pray. When we think of those terms, prayer will always be a chore and a sign of being under the thumb and oppressed by rules. You found that thoroughgoing self-acceptance of yourself as both a child of God who is beloved and as a thing bad Alfie or a demented Al-Anon who is full of fear and anxiety and all of this wrapped together um, that you, you live in a way of life where you don't have to subtract the one or the other. You don't have to subtract and hide our pain and our weakness and therefore put on a false front and we don't have to subtract fact that we're children of God and live in shame and self-contempt. We put them both together and we know that's the way it really is. That's the way it really is. And when we meet each other like that and each person we meet, we see a child of God who is pretty goofy and who needs a lot of support or they'll freak out and pretend they're not goofy or pretend they're not a child of God one or the other. Uh then we need to keep looking at them, convince both that it's the both, and I gotta have people looking at me, convinced that I'm both, so that, and when we're convinced we're both, we feel the same. We feel, and meditation has everything to do with nourishing that, uh, letting the, the best we've experienced have the maximum effect in our life. Now, that's, I just said that from a self-centered point of view, haven't I? To describe the benefit of prayer to us. And, and prayer will get broader than that. It's just something that we do because it's true. You know, whether you're going to feel better or not right away, well, too bad. who cares? Um, you know, it's, it's important to be in on what, what's true is that I'm not God. What's true is that the well of love and wisdom doesn't come out of me. It is within me when I'm humbly ready to acknowledge my higher power. Uh, and it kind of rises to the God within. But I don't own it. I don't own it and I don't control it. I'm a servant. And as we, it's just very fitting for us to, to spend a little time uh, in the presence of the truth and just do it. Just so that we're not swept away with, um, with the lies that, well, with what turns out to be a lie, if that's all we hear. Uh, it's not a lie that you're cute. It is a lie that hearing you're cute all the time is going to do it for you. <laughs> it's a uh, good thing to perspective. Um, praying only for knowledge of God's will for us and the power to carry that out. That's, again, we get the old fear versus faith here. Uh, and I have fear in me all the time. Sometimes when I'm fortunate, the fear is kind of crunched up to the side. It doesn't have too much of an effect. Uh, but it's always there. Uh, it would, but when my fear has some place in me, and when I'm reading, by the way, Diversion here. I, I find, and I've only been able to acknowledge this kind of recently, that the area where old ideas come in to me most strongly is when I think of spiritual things. Go into a church, start to pray, and you feel more like the old days than any other activity you do. And so it's dangerous. 
we can get into start praying, say, okay, time to pray, and immediately fall into guilt. Because uh, you haven't prayed enough, you haven't prayed well enough, who do you think you are? And that's kind of spiritual K, you know what. Um, it isn't the truth. That we, if we can fall into this, uh, it's old ideas. It's, it's the kind of thought process and the little pathways that we've taken a lot when we're thinking in spiritual terms and spiritual words in our life. I think it's good to, to acknowledge that, if, if this is true for you. And I say, just because it will be kind of an automatic association with a lot of our old ideas, doesn't mean that, oh, well, I guess it's just too dangerous for me to pray. I'll think of something else. Maybe high fiber and uh, uh, mega vitamins. Um, no, the prayer has to do with not you know, not designed to get in touch with all our neuroses and old ideas. The whole thing is designed to get in touch with our spiritual awakening that has begun to save our lives and change our lives. And the more we pray and the more we aim it and, and focus on our awakening instead of the old days, uh, the healthier our prayer becomes, the more nourishing. But the as I look at this thing, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out, what I see, well, that, that'll hit my fear, see? Knowledge of God's will. Ding, 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 ding. Uh, and that, I'll think, well, the fun is over. You know God's will. That means you know, pain. You imagine God designing coffee breaks into the uh, into life. Uh, we usually don't think of that. Um, and we're pretty sure he'd rather you not have sex again. Um, if you're a particular kind of neurotic Catholic or Baptist. Um, and if it, 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 it hits us in that fear if God's will rings the bell in you that says deprivation, you're going to miss it. All you're going to get now is God's will, so you're probably going to miss out a lot. You know? And if, if that's the thing, say, oh, that's my fear reacting. That's my fear resonating with what I'm discovering is always for my my new understanding of a higher power from the dumb old God I've got to drag along and give instructions to to the higher power who leads me and who's uh, giving me surprises. Uh, and it's, we have experience, all of us here, the way God's will is not just something that is pretty good of us to be willing just to do God's will. No, come on. Um, God's will is what's rescuing us from our will. Uh, you know, I had my I had my will long enough. I had a good chance, a fair chance, to work it out uh, my way. And then, <laughs> then when I was dropping to the earth, uh, it was about dead, I started to be dragged along into God's will a little bit. Um, and uh, you know, my will consisted uh, of, of pandering to my ego, and because I have a good education. I pandered to my ego in rather sophisticated ways. Uh, I didn't want this growth uh, fulfillment. Uh, I was after a rather high level of psychological integration. Yeah. Um, and uh, I wanted to... Uh, I was after that. Uh, and I wanted to achieve it, and then maybe I'd be happy. Uh, and of course, you know, and I wanted to be good. I wanted to be a good Christian and a good priest. And uh, the way I was going to be able to tell I was a good Christian and a good priest is when I noticed that I was a little better than the other one. Built in comparison thing. Built in. And what does that mean when I start comparing? It means that I want to be good. 
I want to be good. I want to rate high on the scale so that they'll inspire me. And God will think, you're pretty good. And then I'll be all right. And if achieve all rightness by a high rating. You know, and this is fear and ego. It's not the spiritual life. Uh, the spiritual life is uh, exactly what everyone here has experienced when you found yourself early in your recovery in an informal talk with some people or in a meeting where you were acutely aware of your disease and of your comical list of fears and self-obsessions, and that you're being held up in sanity and a willingness just to show up by the sheer grace of God and working through other people, um, and that you knew, and that people could tell that. They could look at you and see you didn't rate very well, and that you knew not rating very well didn't matter at all. I know one of the uh, things I, I can remember the feeling early when I was going to meetings and just first hitting that identification. And I was sober for a month and a half or something. And people would be sober 10 years, 15 years. And, um, and I knew because I was being touched by the program. My month and a half of being sober, I didn't feel the least bit underdog-like or I thought, that's what I am, a month and a half. You're 10 years? Great. Uh, Because we were receiving God's gift, and it just wasn't a matter of comparison. That's not what was going on. What was going on was gratitude for the gift of life. It's sobriety. And once that's going on, that's the spiritual spiritual thing. And when we're into that, uh, we know that we have been drawn away from our usual way of thinking into another whole way of looking at things. And so that then it's God's will. God's, I'm giving an example of getting God's will when we weren't even after us. We're drawn into uh, a way of getting better and a way of life that we weren't even asking for, that we weren't alert or healthy enough to imagine. And it is a sheer gift that we're drawn that way. Or we might have even read about it and idealized about it. A lot of times we get these high ideals, but the ideals are so interwoven with our own fears and insecurities and ego that we want to get a, we want to be very generous and loving and self-giving and be recognized by all as doing that. Or, uh, or, you know, something. You know, just all mixed up with our thing. Then when we're given this thing, uh huh. I just got. I just was drawn into God's will, and all I'm asked is to sign my name to it. I I couldn't think it up. And it, and it and whenever we find ourselves living God's will, it's a liberation. It's always oh, it's what I would have wanted if I knew enough. I would have wanted this. I would have asked uh, if I knew. And I wasn't so preoccupied or scared and everything. And that's God's will. God's will for us. And I want to say God's will for us because I am so much of an individualist. I am so detached and sick that I think of well-being in terms of what's good for me. And once we're on this path of recovery, we we start, we go through a shift, though. And we don't think this was good for me. It's what's good for us. It's what's good for me is when I am relating well with us. Uh, it's good for me is to be identifying with you and having your life and what's going on with you important to me. And yet, have clear boundaries where we don't merge and, and we know that I don't do your chores for you or your for me, uh, that we respect each other's dignity and individual ness, um, but that I identify with you and that I can't even begin 
to live my life in a healthy way and take care of myself unless I know we're linked together in fellowship. Um, that's God's will. So God's praying only for knowledge of God's will for us, the power to carry it out, is not heroic. It isn't ever a matter of being, okay, I'll volunteer. God's will. Uh, you guys keep having your fun and everything. I'm going to go for God's will and see the scouting party that goes out and lives on weeds and uh, uh, <laughs> God's will is always what is the best is our true well-being. If there's anything to the thing that God loves us, He treasures our true well-being because that's what love is. Love is treasuring the well-being of the other. Uh, and he treasures our well-being and he draws us into that. We ask, you know, that, can we, uh, can you pray for particular things? Should you just always say, God's will be done and I can't pray uh, if my mother get over cancer or something? Pray for a chocolate-colored Porsche, you know. Uh, Pray for anything you like. And then say, Thy will be done. Pray for anything you like and then say, Have it your way. Have it what's best for us. I hang on to nothing, no result. Thy will be done, thy will be done, thy will be done. Keep winding me up, please. Uh, and I have this, I have a feeling this prayer is going to kind of dumb higher power. And I think maybe there's a little ego and selfishness here, but I would like a little upgrade on my hi-fi system. Um, uh, I know the three thousand dollars probably feed a lot of people in Ethiopia, but uh, uh, I, I'm going to try not to think about that between now and the time. I go to the store, uh, and if you put some obstacle in my way to stop me, well, I will be done. Um, we can, I don't know what I'm doing this one. Um, I will be done. We we just need uh, we need to be rescued by God's will. Uh, a few things you know, people ask: How can I tell what God's will is? Well, the whole program, this, the whole way of life we have. Is designed to give us some chance of recognizing what God's will is. Um, uh, one thing, when the word phrase God's will comes up is uh, a couple of things I want to say. One is, I think it's always God's will that I take care of what's in front of me, that I simply play the hand that's dealt to me right now. That it's God's will that I handle and take and deal with what's here the best I can in the light of the program in the light of my own time. Now that may sound like so commonplace. Well, of course. But what I notice myself is that when I get God's will and my expectations kind of mixed up, I'll often have the impression that, oh, it all went wrong already. So it's no use. It doesn't matter what you do now. You screwed it up. That's never the case. Never, ever, ever. There's always something to do that is in harmony with God's will for us. Always something to do. Indeed. Another thing, if we start meditating on God's will, that's a dangerous thing to do. Because we can, we tend to crawl into the back of God's head and try to psych him out, figure out what he's, what he's doing. Now when uh, somebody we, we love is killed, you know, we, we try to call on God's head and figure, what are you up to, God? What, what were you doing? Well, how come you did that? Well, maybe it was because of this. We get our, a disease ourselves. We think, well, is this God's will? We try to call on God's head and figure out what he was up to. And, and um, if you catch yourself crawling into God's head, crawl out as fast as you can, backward. Get out of there. Um, it's Leaves nothing but trouble. Uh, we're incompetent to get in there. We just come up with the stupidest thing uh, 
when we're trying to psych out God. Um, that's not what it's all. It's always going to say what's God's will for me, not what's God's will of this transcendent order of the universe kind of thing. Because we're incompetent to speak of those things, and we just get mixed up uh, and, and project dumb things onto God. We, we wind up with a big dumb cruel God who can't quite get the harvest in without killing seventy people. Um, uh, yeah. And we we need to what's God's will for me? You know? Anyway, uh, if I'm going to start this a little late, I want to say one more thing about God's will. I think. Uh, oh, I guess I said it. Um, One word about formal prayer. Uh, formal prayer has a, a bad name. Uh, we're, uh, you know, what's really good is to speak from your heart and have your own prayer. And that is the highest form of prayer. It's simply discovering the identification that God is speaking to you and saying from your heart. Formal prayer has a place in life, however. And it's a matter of uh, whenever we pray the Lord's Prayer, it's a formal prayer. Uh, what that is is a distillation of the spiritual experience of your mother's father. It's it's some, it's the well-worn prayer of people who had a spiritual awakening, and we kind of get in on the on an authentic prayer. You read the scripture of your faith. Uh, read some program literature. And when we get in on that prayer, sometimes we are unable altogether to identify with it. And so it's something much comfortable. Except the fact that we, that something always comes to prayer, and that if we stop and simply turn towards our higher power to pay attention, and it doesn't work, it works. If we stop and turn towards our higher power, uh, we're not listening to you-know-what, and we are touched and there's, it's something like the relationship um, of husband and wife, of lovers, of very good friends. Uh, there are all kinds of levels of intensity of communication, from uh, you know, a very special moment of just uh, clear love and understanding, or um, down to doing the dishes together, or just having a cup of coffee while both read the newspaper. Um, if you're both having a cup of coffee and reading the newspaper in a friendly, accepting spirit, um, uh, that's nourishing. And if you uh, attempt to have a conversation that doesn't work too well, you didn't get, get it across, but if you were kind of earnestly trying to pay attention to somebody, a friend of yours, and it, well, it didn't go too well, well, you paid it, they know you paid attention to it. And that's part of life. You know? uh, prayer is it's part of life, regular stuff. Uh, you don't have to, it doesn't have to be intense all the time at all. And most of the time it isn't. Uh, most of the time it's like communication with somebody who's going to get in your life. It's a lot of regular old stuff. Um, but formal prayer uh, is um, and it's walking along a path with your mothers and fathers. Uh, and when you identify a bit, in fact, if you read your, your scripture or, or prayers that are formal, Try to have that in mind. That you ask, what's authentic here? What's the good news here? What's hmm, this? Somebody was turned on when they wrote this, and the, and a million other people identified with it, or it wouldn't be in the book. Uh, hmm, what if I can? I want to see if I can ring my bell and get drunk uh, with this sort of thing, and then be gentle with it. And if it isn't, it isn't. It does that. Uh, but I just want to suggest that as an attitude. About and now, for the last few minutes here, um, I'd like you to, I'd like you just to have a little meditation, and maybe we could actually uh, kind of squirm around in your seat and kind of get a little more relaxed. And uh, uh, we might even try to close our eyes. And um, and I want to suggest in this meditation, we simply. 
walk along a path and consider what our higher power is doing in us. What our higher power has been doing with us this time since we started recovery. And uh, our higher power has been not so much piling gifts, but he's gotten very deep within us and has changed our taste. We who are alcoholic here have a taste for getting hot. The way of being able to stand it. Our higher power has come and has given us a taste for sobriety. And he's building that taste day by day as we identify with other sober alcoholics. And all of us have a taste for Achieving security by controlling. It's a dream of control. And our higher power has gotten very deep within us, so deep that it's in there where our free will is. He, re- he doesn't ch- push us or change us. It's below our awareness. And he's giving us a taste for letting go and granting freedom. He's giving us a taste for trusting the natural process. He's giving us a taste for respecting the freedom and dignity of others. He's giving us a taste for trust. We used to have an ideal of getting everything together right. Uh, and that usually did not include other people being in on what we're doing and we're going to do it with them or to them. And our higher power is giving us a taste for fellowship, giving us a taste for the quality of love and understanding that comes about when we gather together freely and wait upon one another and wait upon the other to share, and we suffer with that person in their struggle to share, and we trust others to let us struggle to share. And it's, a lot of times, we even doubt the whole worthwhileness of it. But we're giving a taste, and the taste is going deeper. So the kind of fellowship and trust and solidarity Oh, now, that we're getting the taste for uh, is what we need to live. And this new taste of fellowship is obviously a gift because we couldn't get it on our own. And we're getting a taste for loving service. We always liked the idea of loving service, but we spent so much time people-pleasing and being forced to do things and being worried about criticism and doing so much nervously that we're just exhausted, hurt, and leave me alone. And we're being drawn into a kind of service that does not deplete us, that is witnessing to the message freely given. And pass it on, uh, knowing we don't own it, and yet our own story is a necessary mixture for it to be understandable. And we're getting a taste for spending some time and being a servant. And it's kind of a surprise because we're, most of us are sick of service, and it's driven by fear. Higher power is nourishing and letting the taste for letting go of sobriety, fellowship, service. It's like a seed within us, the yeast into the dough, or the mustard seed. It's in us and it's growing. And we're being given a taste for patience. Now that the faith is growing. Find more trust in God's loving care when we are 
testify to begin with our own fears, our own powerlessness over our fears and hang up. And the old ideas return constantly to solve our problems in the old way. And we know that we have a higher power who patiently waits for us to drop the old ways again. And to humbly do good works will always feel like fools. We know that no matter what they're doing, it's not very long that I'm Pray a formal prayer together. We're going to pray the Lord's Prayer. I think we can just say in rows, it's a little too tough. Stand up, but if we get all around the circle, we kind of tear the place apart. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Back works. Thank you, Father Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.